All right, welcome everybody. Uh, tonight's work session is going to be dealing with the uh, city uh, city council agenda for Monday, June eighth, twenty twenty, four thirty, or it's four thirty today, June eighth. Sorry, uh, the the uh, city council session will be June fifteenth. We're going to go off uh, kilter a little bit here. We have a couple of guests tonight, so we're going to try and get them out. First and foremost, like all the call or all the meetings lately. If you're streaming, uh, you can see us and hopefully hear us. If you uh, want to call in, the public access number will be up on the screen momentarily. It, the number is 646-749-3122, and it's meeting number 791-645-725. There it is. Mr. Tislin got caught up. He does everything here getting ready for that meeting, so thank you. Um, first up, we're going to have a swim club lap swimming um, discussion. So a couple gentlemen here from the Eastern Iowa Swim Federation. A uh, couple discussion points tonight, one being uh, kind of plans to open the pool, uh, which there is a memo laid out in your council packet on some options there. Currently, we're only allowed to do lap swim and swim lessons only, uh, very limited use through at least June 17th. Um, at that time, I guess we'll see if things change through the governor's office. But uh, we had a request from the swim club to uh, use the pool for uh, swim training as well. Um, and then their program was laid out in the uh, memo as well. Uh, I guess before we start any of that, we had uh, some repairs on the pool, drain the pool, and found that the liner is pulling away in a portion of it. Uh, it is under warranty currently. Um, so we're working with the company. Uh, they did email, it's two to three weeks out from scheduling that. So. Uh, at this point, we don't know where we're at in the process, but we can't do anything or fill the pool until that's completed. Um, in the memo, we had stated uh, unless we're able to open the pool early July, we probably wouldn't recommend opening uh, at that point just based on staffing and ability to operate the pool. So um, if we do uh, are able to open or get this fixed in a timely manner and open, uh, staff would recommend uh, being able to do at least swim lessons and see kind of where the governor stands. I know there is the second consideration, whether it operated is, uh, it is a loss, general fund loss annually. Um, we wouldn't do season passes probably this year, probably would be a bigger loss, especially in FY21. So that consideration as well, um, and maybe Jim has more input on that, but obviously we know where we're at financially and uh, some of those uh, sales tax and hotel motel, but uh, if we are able to open and we do open uh, We would recommend a $25 per hour uh, Rental fee to the swim club mm -hmm. for uh, their use. Uh, we would only recommend that we do that uh, Lease or agreement if we are open for general public whether that lap swim or general use so okay. uh, If we're not open on our end, we wouldn't recommend doing anything with any outside group just we have to fill the pool fuller, add more chemicals, do regular testing from staff, and uh, and then just the uh, calls that I'm sure we'll receive. Why are they using it, and why can't the public use it? So right. that's kind of where we're at. Okay. I, I mean, it really makes it tough. The school's going to be back in session earlier, um, almost three weeks earlier than it was last year. You've got a real short window to operate. So I, unless, my opinion, unless you get a chance to get it fixed within, you know, before July 1st, you, I would say you're probably going to leave it shut down for the year. And that's what a lot of other communities are doing. So we had a survey. Jim had a, or passed on a survey of other communities. Uh, I think there's around 90 or so uh, responses to that. Half, and that was last week, half had decided at that point to close for the season. I think it's 44. Of the other half, half were waiting to see if the governor was going to open things up more and just kind of wait and see on their own end. <coughs> So about 22, we're waiting, and about 22, 23, where it said they're going to open in some capacity, whether it's swim lessons or lap swim or hope they can open more. So at this point, most of the larger communities, I think other than Des Moines, have decided to close for the year, just not even open. Uh, and like I said, the other half are kind of either waiting and seeing or just uh, doing lap swim and swim, or swim lessons at this point. So. Okay. Because the majority of our citizens 
reside by a large body of water in the Mississippi. I think if we could open for the swim lessons, I think that would be really, really important. Mm -hmm. So I'm, ho I'm hoping that we can get the repairs done and, and open her up. did a valve repair in the deep end and that's kind of why we drained the pool and then found this item so it's something we couldn't open with this we don't want to have further damage or someone get hurt with it so. <coughs> okay uh you guys have yeah. anything or? is that and if kind we do of open, put you guys in limbo with us I, yeah I guess, yeah i guess my my stance is one yeah you need to come up front you now you know the drill <laughs> you gotta come up so so Name I, and address, please. Ryan Ritter, 117 Thanks, Glendale. Um, no, I understand if if it's gonna if it has to be open. The only difference is we don't need any staff. You don't have to hire lifeguards mm -hmm. for us. So you don't have to hire lifeguards. You, you do need the chemicals. Um, so I get that. But if it gets later and it's able to run, and you want to, we're still here. So we, I mean, we we provide our own lifeguard. We provide. I mean, all that stuff. The only thing that would be would be the chemicals and Brad checking it. So, okay. if the twenty-five dollars an hour is something that works for you after it gets fixed and you want to do that, let us know. Well, well I think what we'll do for now is is probably table it and see how long it takes to get the repair done. Or not table it, but wait and see how long it gets repair done. Wouldn't you say, Eric? Is that where you're once, at? Once we get back from them, we'll I guess okay. if they get a schedule and then we scheduling can... for a certain date, we can let. Okay. And then we can reach out and, and, and we get get there. back together and go from there. And then then the discussion will be: Do you want to open because it is a larger loss in yeah. the FY21 budget? So. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? How Matt? much? How much would, do you think it costs to put chemicals in that pool? For the for, I mean, if you started July 1st, what kind of cost are we talking about? Um, so typically we budget for for the annual year about $13,000 for the chemical budget. And you're going to cut that in half, obviously, um, because... Probably, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. Obviously, we're going to have to start up um, and treat the water. And we've already started once. I actually had it full, and, and the water was treated before we determined we, we were losing some water and stuff. And so we had to take that out but uh, you know we would be going back and starting over on July 1 um, I would say probably six to seven thousand um, dollars maybe just a little bit more um, we do have the chemical on hand I've actually brought an order in so we are sitting on a full load of chlorine and acid and things like that so we already have it in hand in that regard yeah and we can carry it over chlorine does weaken a little bit but um, it would still be salvageable for next year okay and one thing you have to keep in mind is that we lose money on our parks every year, but it's a vital part of a quality of life issue. Okay. It's just brought forward for council since yep. it is something okay. unique. So. All right. Well, keep us Thanks, posted. Sir. Thank you, Eric. Jim? Yeah, I guess just on the, we've talked about the pool uh, for this season. Besides not having a firm date, we don't know if we ever do get a firm date where we can do anything. Uh, either from the governor's level or from having it fixed, uh, what we have for the ability to do with staffing. Um, you know, we uh, started this, when we did budget session uh, and approved a budget in March, <clears throat> we approved a budget that had about a thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, somewhere in that neighborhood, maybe, actually it might have been a little bit less than that this year, uh, for positive cash in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it was, cash fairly cash neutral um, right now if I were to look at what we're using for estimates we're a $500,000 deficit for next year yeah. but there's so many unknowns I don't know where we actually end up I mean we're gonna have things that will uh, hopefully help out during the course of the year but we're not in the same situation that we were three months ago when we were talking about budgets for next year sure uh, a $30,000 loss that we typically see on the pool is going to mean a bigger deal this next year than it typically right. would. Just a quick question. You mentioned staffing. So the do we have people on hand already, already hired to staff the pool nope. if we decide to open it next week? Nope. Okay. So you're going to have to hire. You're still going to, I mean, assuming we decide we're going to open the pool, you're still going to have to go through a round of hiring in order to get lifeguards and, and do all that stuff, people. right? 
So right now, I, have I know a I know you guys don't need lifeguards, yeah. but I'm just talking about from the public's aspect. Yeah. Right now, we have t essentially staff on hold that are looking for their summer job and hope for their summer job that you know, and we're uh, they're texting me what's the status and things like that uh, uh, mm -hmm. every day. Um, I would hope that I would still be able to staff at least at some respect on July one. But, you know, obviously maybe we tell some of them that if they have opportunities, they should take them as well. Um, I have also tried to, uh, you know, hold a few spots in some of our other programs, like maybe at the golf course or something where I need some staff to fill in that maybe I can move some of them there for the time being and things like that. But um, it's, we're probably going to lose some, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Brad. Council, you have any other thoughts or comments? Thank you, gentlemen. We'll uh, keep you posted. All right, next we'll move on to, uh, we have a COVID-19 presentation. Welcome Dr. Mike McCoy. He's gonna give us a little uh, update. This is a presentation you made to the chamber as well, of the Greater Burlington Partnership, is that correct? Yeah, I, uh, so I guess Mike McCoy, 918 North 3rd. Um, so uh, yeah, I made a, a presentation. Um, Stella had asked me to come and, and talk before their like joint powers board, or I think that's what it's called. Um, and, and tried to do a little preparation for the hospital in this endeavor. So I thought she I was asked to kind of try to come and share a few aspects of that. And then, um, you know, I will certainly try to answer questions as best I can. Um, and I'll just kind of give you a little bit of a journey of where the hospital's been through this process because it's been um, a long three months. So um, uh, I'm the chief medical officer out at the, out at the facility uh, and I've been serving in that capacity for about five years. Um, I kind of for a while was doing half clinical and half administrative and now I'm just kind of doing all administrative work. So I'm trying to use the other side of my brain uh, but I, I guess I'd just like to, I started previous talks in our, in, in our uh, hospital and for some of our uh, leadership uh, managers and directors with the following quote, and I'm not sure we're still very far off from where I started with this a couple months ago, is that we know there are things we know we know, and we also know there are known unknowns. That is to say that we know there are some things that we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns, the one we don't know that we don't know. And I, I think, you know, sometimes that's the journey we've been through here a little bit. So if we go back to mid-March, the governor's proclamation comes. Um, out at the hospital, we stopped all elective surgeries. We had visitor restrictions, um, visitor and staff screening. We stopped routine, preventive, clinical, and ambulatory visits, including therapies and diagnostic imaging. We set up an ambulatory telehealth platform for virtual visits in a matter of two to three weeks. We had had that platform set up for inpatient work, but we did not have it set up for outpatient ambulatory work. We set up a COVID unit. We converted our digestive health center into a 28 bed COVID unit because we had enough negative air pressure rooms in that area that we could do that. Um, we converted our Burlington Area Family Practice uh, building into a respiratory center. That's now been changed over to the quick care location in an effort to try to triage and treat COVID patients and non-COVID patients separately for safety reasons. We've set up a drive-through testing and triage site now that test Iowa uh, that started in late May. So what do we need to prepare for? Well, that was sort of the question we were asking ourselves when this all started because we just didn't really know what was gonna face us. Um, we went to the uh, Iowa, or the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and there's maybe the IHME as a lot of things that you can find on the web related to this. And in an early April, the initial projection showed that by late April, here in Iowa, we would be unable to handle the patient COVID numbers that were projected to come at us. Um, so we set up a system incident and command between Great River Medical Center, Fort Madison Community Hospital and Henry County Health Center looking at us as a region. Uh, we decided right at that time we're going to follow CDC and IDPH guidelines, the Center for Disease Control and the Iowa Department of Public Health. And while those are very dynamic, um, you've got to have you've got to have a foundation. And so we said from step one we're going to we're going to follow those guidelines. We're going to keep calm, make a plan, and follow the plan. And then what we had to do was prepare for this in phases as best we could, what we could with facilities, what we had for staff. Um, to, to be able to prepare for this. So we started 
In Southeast Iowa, we, we sort of looked at an eight county region uh, for the three hospitals. We did population and demographic studies. In Iowa, we looked at Des Moines, Lee, Henry, Van Buren, and Louisa counties. In Illinois, Hancock and Henderson, and in Missouri, Clark County. That service area population is just under 150,000. Um, we, uh, from, from Iowa, Iowa Hospital Association data and other data that we have, know that our ED will serve about 65% of the population in those counties. So we were looking at a population of just under 90,000. Uh, we looked at incidents, symptoms, fatality rates, and these were all estimates at the time by the WHO or the World Health Organization because we really didn't have other good data to go by. The initial estimates and modeling showed that we would struggle to meet the demands. Um, so at phase one, we set up our COVID unit. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a 28-bed uh, COVID unit, um, 12 ventilator beds and ICU beds, uh, 16 acute care beds. These are all in negative pressure rooms. Our phase two would have had to take all of our operating rooms, utilizing the ventilators in there and the negative uh, pressure rooms we have in about half of the OR and convert those from OR rooms to, uh, to acute care rooms. We then took the respiratory center and we set that up to triage and treat COVID and non-COVID patients separately. So uh, the Southeast Iowa COVID-19 hospital simulation modeling began uh, as soon as we thought we had some data that made any sense. So we utilized a um, uh, University of Pennsylvania Department of uh, Biostatistics and Epidemiology uh, model. This would be the same model that they used uh, for some of the Unity Point hospitals in the state. And some of the main factors, and we got then more data from this, is we looked at contact from social distancing in this model, the doubling time or rate for new cases um, during an early phase of an outbreak, we looked at our hospitalization percentages, ICU percentages, and the ventilator need percentages for patients that become ill, and the length of stay for each one of those categories. We looked at the detection rates, the incubation times, and the fact that at the time, and still to somewhat, we do have limited rapid testing available. We were looking at hospital cases, not community cases, I should point out. Our initial projections with this new data said that if we that we would need about a 55% contact reduction within our region to avoid exceeding our capacity or critical mass. So when we first looked at this, and this was back in early April, um, we had 16 COVID unit beds for acute care. Uh, at 20% contact reduction, we would need 80 beds. At 40% contact reduction, we would need 30. For ICU or ventilators, we had 12. At 20% contact reduction, we would need 35 ventilators, and at 40% contact reduction, we would need 13. And so um, we started then starting with phase one, realizing phase one may not be enough. The models, then we started to be able to get our own data. We started to be able to get more data from, from the state and our region. And once again, looking at the social distancing, the efforts being made with hand washing, maximizing the virtual care and screening mask use, uh, our, the, the, the things you've been reading about is sort of flattening the curve um, worked. And fortunately it did, because otherwise we, there was not a hospital in the state. We, we didn't have the capacity with all the hospitals in the state or even look at our region to take care of the projected numbers of patients that would be coming at us. By flattening the curve, the previous 55% contact reduction needed now can be achieved with about 20% contact reduction. That's what our current models show. So I, I'm going to go through just a couple slides and I'll finish up with some comments. So if we could, the, up here it says 521. Um, that really hasn't changed a lot. But I wanted, to, I wanted to go to this, yeah, thank you, go to this next slide. I wanted to go to this slide to kind of show you when, what we can learn a lot from history because really what we have here is we have a, a virus that we have no treatment for. We have no vaccine for. And if you really go back to 100 years ago to the influenza uh, pandemic then, and you look at what happened in the differences between the cities of Philadelphia and St. Louis, Philadelphia unfortunately did not start social distancing early enough. They didn't realize what had hit them and they were overwhelmed. They started social distancing when it was kind of too late. The city of St. Louis, as you can see, started social distancing right as things started. And they were able to flatten the curve but I think the thing that's a little bit of the unknown there, you see that kind of resurgence, that second hump? 
Um, that's sort of what we don't know. Um, and I think oh, I'll kind of talk about that a little bit. So we've fortunately been able to, to flatten the curve to the point that at this time, we've been able to handle the patients that have come to us. We're just not sure what this is gonna look like this fall or winter. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So uh, what in our new projections, what we really were, look, were looking at is being able to predict community spread uh, no one can predict isolated outbreaks. And so some of this is just sort of stating that these projections, I think, are very good at looking at, at the community spread. We look uh, at uh, our regions, our percent positive cases uh, daily. We look at the state's numbers uh, daily. We update this model weekly. But when you have an isolated outbreak, like we had in a couple of our uh, long-term care facilities, group homes, and or uh, manufacturing plants, um, some of our numbers went up um, and that's kind of what this is showing that we can't really predict that. Um, so the next slide. And so just the definitions of what we're, what we're talking about here when we show you this, the, these, these graphs, 20% contract reduction really is talking about doing nothing. Um, because we're really not at zero. We see, we don't feel like we're at zero here because of our population density. We don't have to rely on mass transit and the distance we have from either other major metropolitan areas. So doing nothing in New York City is different than doing nothing here. So we feel like we're at a 20% contact reduction with not having to do much else right now. A 40% contact reduction then would mean the schools are closed. A 55% contact reduction, the schools are closed and not essential businesses remain closed, and then the really pronounced social distancing continues. So those are sort of some of the parameters to think about when I show you some of the numbers that we, that we used in our model. The next slide, please. So if you look at this, um, what you see here is we have, a, as I mentioned up at the top, in our COVID unit, in our acute care, ACU stands for acute care unit, we have 16 beds. On the right slide there, you see at 16, there's a purple line, that's our capacity. Um, if, you, if you notice, at, at the, 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 when we had a sort of an outbreak in the community, our projection on the left had showed that even at a 20% contact reduction, um, which is the, the you, you can see there that we would still maintain that curve. We can only project these models out 30 days. They don't go out further than that. So that's why we're getting a 30-day window. But even out roughly at 30 days, we were still well under the 16, and you can see how low the numbers are with more contact reduction at 40 and 55%. Uh, and the, uh, and on, the, on the right side, wh what that sort of shows is when we had that outbreak, our numbers went up in our unit, our numbers reflected that. And as you can see, at a 20% contact reduction, the red line went above 16 at about three weeks later. And so, um, so that's the things we can't predict. We fortunately haven't had a census so far in our COVID unit above eight. That's the, that's the highest census we've had so far. Um, but if there's, if there's something that happens, if Klein Center gets an outbreak in it, we'll become overwhelmed really quick. Um, next slide. This is looking at the ICU census. Um, and and there, there's another slide after this that we'll skip because it's a ventil ventilator, but it's essentially the same data. And really what that's, what that's looking at is, uh, and, and I, should, I should point out, we're looking at these numbers. Uh, Fort Madison Hospital would be able to take care of two to three patients. Henry County Health Center would probably be able to take care of a couple of patients depending on their acuity. So to be conservative, we just tried to base our data on the, the COVID unit that we had here. Um, and like I said, um, um, as you can see here, um, even at a 20% contact reduction, um, we're, we're below the number of ICU beds and ventilators we would need projecting out 30 days ahead if we can maintain that, okay? So I, I think um, what I just sort of finished with is, is with these predictive modeling simulations, we can't get anything that's anywhere near reliable, we think, any more than 30 days out. We look at these weekly. We're looking at our census data and our percentage of positives in the state, the region, and in each of our three counties and the surrounding counties. Um, so when you look at the guidelines for opening up America again, it started with these phase guidelines and this, this gating criteria. Um, and a lot of studies have shown that not 
probably the majority of places really kind of started opening up a little bit before we may have actually technically met all of these uh, guidelines. But we needed a 14-day downward trajectory for cases or positive tests. Uh, the highest number of positive tests we had was back in the very later part of April and the very early part of May. It's been coming down, it's been plateaued, so really for the last month we have had a very flat um, uh, number of those. We're currently running at about five to six percent of our tests that we do are positive. Um, the hospitals have to be able to treat all the patients without crisis care and have robust, now without crisis care. So once we started wanting to open up and uh, let's say do elective surgeries, that meant we had to have enough PPE to be able to not use anything from um, Des Moines County Emergency Services, et cetera. We had to be able to have what we needed to open up. And then robust testing. Um, I, I would tell you at this time, I don't think we have robust testing. We have good testing for test IO. We have good testing we can do to get a two to three day turnaround time. We don't have enough testing to get a rapid test that we can get back in an hour. We have those tests, they're limited, and we really try to save those for certain situations in the hospital. So we do not have robust rapid testing. Um, and then it talked about in, including emerging antibody testing. We could talk about that maybe in a minute. That's kind of not really helpful that much for clinical reasons right now. It may be helpful for population health and studies and, and how to look at that, look at false negatives, but otherwise it's not really helping the clinicians as much. Um, so, um, and really right now, um, uh, we just got our, we just got rapid testing in house May 1st. Um, Henry County Health Center and Fort Mass Community Hospital just got rapid testing ju around June 1st and none of us have enough of them. Um, we need the testing and contact tracing and that's what, you know, what through test Iowa and the Iowa Department of Public Health and I think the key in the future to the fall and the winter is going to be if, if we don't have enough people to do the, the, the contact tracing, um, we'll, we'll be in trouble. And then we have to maintain our health care system capacity. So to open things up, we have to maintain 30% of our beds for COVID related work. And it can't just be a bed beside another bed, it's gotta be a whole unit, negative pressure, it's kind of a big deal. So we got, a, got kind of a big part of our hospital sitting there waiting that's not being used right now. And of course that doesn't help the, the bottom line. We started with phase one of elective surgeries uh, and then phase two states and regions with no evidence of rebound can, and satisfy the gating criteria a second time can then move into phase two. So we are preparing for the next 18 to 24 months. Um, I firmly believe we'll have a second wave that'll be a resurgence this fall or winter. Um, this really won't decrease until 60 to 70 percent of the population is infected and immune. Um, with a pandemic, you have kind of a new virus, and so no one has immunity to it. Um, and, and really, if you just look at the facts and the science and the microbiology, this isn't going to go away and it's not going to be done soon. The, the IHME just uh, kind of mentions that as we get new data, it increases the accuracy of the predictive modeling, but it also estimates the pandemic's trajectory would change and dramatically for the worse if people ease up on social distancing. So if you look at the models in the history, I think a lot of pandemic infections do not tend to be seasonal. Um, they, this one has a long incubation period. It's, it's got more asymptomatic spread than a lot of others. It's got a higher R naught. I don't know if you've seen or read the R with the, the number. It's, it's the average number of people infected with, by each person. And the, the R naught is, the R is 1.2 for seasonal flu. For COVID, it's about R2 to 2.5. They're still trying to get that number figured out. So it's just, uh, it just spreads more easily than the flu. Um, so we are, we are having to prepare to reinstitute mitigation measures in the fall or winter if we need to. Um, a vaccine will certainly help, but I don't think it'll likely be available some, until sometime in 2021. Um, and just one of the latest things I just pulled up from the IHME site just today, no one is coming. So the total deaths in Iowa now are about 650. Um, it, IHME is projecting by the first week in August, we'll have about 1,040 deaths. Our change in mobility, in mid-April, we we, the mobility was, was down about 41%, and now with the current changes, we're down about 19%, and I think, so who knows what the fall will look like when they, when they measure those numbers. And I think some of those is, is the change in mobility. I'm not sure how well that sometimes um, moves over into how well we're social distancing. But, but I do think um, 
that I, I certainly understand for many reasons, financial state of mind, um, a variety of reasons. Um, everyone needs to sort of start uh, living and kind of doing things again. But I think we have to be really smart about it. Um, and the, the, certainly the things were, that were, we were doing so well to keep us under the curve of being able to hit critical mass, uh, we have to be careful. Because I think the biggest fear when I talk to the docs um, is flu season is going to come upon us. And it's going to be really hard with the symptoms you have to tell what's flu and what's COVID. And you're trying to take care of people separately. And if you don't have rapid tests to do so, it's going to be, it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be any fun. And uh, flu season alone can be a problem. And then if this is on top of it, um, I, think we'll, I think we'll worry about critical mass again. So I don't know what questions I have other than having some of my own, but I'd be glad to try to address anything I can. Uh, do you foresee rapid testing being in the pipeline as something being available to you by the fall? Well, I certainly hope so. I was talking to our, our, our lab director today, and I said, you know, we, we've been asking um, every day. Um, and if, if we have it available for the fall, it'll make it a lot easier for our clinicians to be able to take care of people and know who's got what and get them in the appropriate care setting right away. But if we don't, it's going to make it really difficult. And um, like I said, we, we've got tests, plenty of access to tests that we can get a two to three day turnaround time, 48 to 72 hours. But that's not that helpful. We, we really need rapid testing. Hmm. So I don't know the answer to that. I wish I did. We're ordering it, we're calling every day, and we really don't have any good um, allotment numbers we're given. They just tell, they, they notify us today the before they're gonna send us something, and it's never what we asked for, so. Yeah. The population immunity that you referred to, that 60%, is that is that what it would need to be in this area before we're at a point where we could probably be comfortable with it? Yeah, I, you know, I think most epidemiologists would say until 60% of the population's immune, then you really can't yeah, this is still going to be a problem. And, and, and I think right now in the state of Iowa, there's been about 20,000 tests for antibodies, uh, and about 9% of those tests have been positive. Um, and mostly what that's used for, for rapid responders, make sure you don't have a false negative, um, looking to make sure um, uh, for um, um, mostly convalescent plasma donation. So it, it's really used for that right now. Um, once we get a vaccine, that will certainly be helpful. The, the, the reason we're having a hard time with antibody tests, because we can get an antibody test right now, but as a, as a clinician, you don't know what to tell someone that means. Um, because normally you'd say, well, you got an antibody to that, so you're immune, but we don't know that. We don't know at what level of, antibody, uh, of an antibody you need to be immune. We don't know how long you'd be immune for. So the last thing you want to do is give someone the false hope that you're immune now and you're not. There's, there's just a lot of unknowns. There's a lot more data we're getting, um, you know, as we go. Some blood types seem to respond worse than that. There's all kinds of things out there. We're learning about it as we go, but that's the problem. We're dealing with it now with not a lot of good data. And that's the, that's the frustration for most of the clinicians, so. I go into hospice house almost every day and visit my mother-in-law that's out there. And it seems like the symptoms that they screen for are changing all the time is that because the virus is mutating or um, so we're we're changing those the the CDC and the IDPH guidelines have been very dynamic and we change uh, as they change and so uh, you know I think they're changing those based on the data that they're getting um, and so it's been very frustrating for a lot of our staff because we 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 get a plan in place and then we change it and then we change it and then we change it and um, change fatigue has been hard um, so we're just trying to stay with IDPH and CDC guidelines because that's really, at the end of the day, the only, that's the best information we have. So we, 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 that's what we're sticking with. So that's why you're seeing those changes because they're making the change in recommendations. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you agree that the goal is to look as if we over, over prepared? We've yeah, you know, we talked at the hospital and we said, you know, we would much rather be um, criticized for over preparing than under preparing because if we under prepare, we just, we won't have time. So. Yeah. so I think you guys have done a great job so far, and I hope we can say the same thing yeah, this fall and winter. Yeah, thank you. I just hope, with just this fall and winter, I think it's got everybody a little bit nervous. So. Um, just for the folks listening at home and those of us up here, is there any advice that you would have um, 
that you'd like to pass along? You know, you, you, you've heard it over and over and over again, but you know, like, like what is a close contact? Well, a close contact is, you know, uh, within six feet for more than 15 minutes. So a lot of times we get nervous and we get weird about each other socially and you see people and they're walking around like they can't talk to each other because we're getting in our own little shell, you know. And so um, ju just kind of remember a close contact is, is that. Um, and so, um, you know, yeah, you can still be around people, but you just have to be careful with close contacts. And I think, I think the thing is it really goes back to um, hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Um, and, you know, um, being careful with close contacts. I know the masks, no one likes the masks. Um, the, the, the masks just get really old. Um, but there was epidemiologic information that came out the other day. I read that, it's, just, well, it's easy for me to remember. So, uh, but it just made a lot of sense. It said if 60% of the population wore a mask that was 60% effective, then, then you could pretty much, we wouldn't have to worry about the fall. But how many people are, can really wear a mask 60% of the time? Um, you know, and not outside, not when you're driving your car, but when you're around people. And, and, it's, and it's really, you know, I think a lot of folks too, the mask doesn't help protect me from anything. It's helping me not give it to you. And so I think it's you, you help me and I'll help you. And, and we gotta do this both ways. But um, I think uh, th that's, that's really it, is being careful with, with social distancing being careful with washing your hands, wear a mask when you need to wear a mask. Um, um, I, I don't like the things either, but it's just sort of what we need to do right now. And we just need to do this until we get a treatment. Uh, but really, r r realistically, we need to do it until we get a vaccine. Because it, it won't go away, it'll still be here until we get immunity and a vaccine, so. Does anybody else have any questions for the doctor? Thank you, sir. Hey, really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time. Much. Thanks. Thanks, Doc. All right, we'll move on to the proposed uh, regular agenda. First up is public hearing consideration of sale of property lot number two of Parkview Subdivision 707 Shakakan Drive at City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. This is the second of the lots that we're uh, hoping to sell. Uh, we previously sold 701 Shakakan Drive. There is a house going up on that lot currently. Uh, we did uh, receive uh, two bids, one uh, for 25,000, one uh, was under that. Uh, our recommended minimum originally was 30,000 and amended that to 25,000 after sitting for a while. Uh, so uh, we may have two bidders uh, coming in at it, but we'll have at least one minimum at 25,000. Uh, they d do still have the covenants. Um, all three of these lots have restrictive covenants. Um, they have to start a home within 12 months of purchase and complete within 24 months. Uh, has to have, have an attached two-car garage and at least 1,250 square feet of living space on the main floor. Um, and then the owner has to maintain the lot. So uh, hopefully uh, this will lead to the last uh, lot getting sold as well. And when do the this. covenants go? Uh, when are they terminated? And at what point? Um, I'd the... have to read through those. Those are drafted by our attorney. Um, Is this adjacent to Dankwood Park? Yeah. Park's just on the north side of Shaka Khan there, um, just to the east of Madison. Uh, keep going down that road, it'll run into that where the pool kind of yeah, yeah, goes yeah. into. Where the old Elm Care, mm -hmm. Elmview Care was. These are, these are the houses that I hit with my Frisbee? Probably. <laughs> well, they will be, the houses that you hit with your Frisbee. I'd have to look. I'll try and find that and get that. Yeah, there. just curious. So, um, does the other? We've got two lots. If we've got two bidders. Is there any reason why one wouldn't want to choose the other? I don't know. We'd recommend that both be at least twenty-five thousand. Uh, yeah. yeah, but that would be an option. Uh, yeah, they're similar lots. They're both seven hundred seven and seven thirteen have the option for a walkout basement. So. Uh, they're pretty similar condition in the slope and so mm -hmm. size is exactly the same for all three lots. Okay. Um, well, hopefully we'll sell, sell them, sell yeah. them both. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions? Park right across the street, people yeah, no decided. kidding. I feel like Frisbee Golf, you're golden. All right, that's good. Let's uh, move on. Public hearing, consideration of a permanent encroachment agreement with CMM Company, LC, for the encroachment into Market Street right away adjacent to 107 Valley Street 
Burlington, Iowa. Eric, again. So this is uh, Frank Miller Company on the corner of, this is uh, Main Street on the west and Market Street on the south. Uh, they own the entire block up to Valley Street on the north. Uh, it's all addressed off Valley Street, but this is on Market Street. Uh, so they did their addition on Main Street a couple years ago, and then this addition back here a few years before that. They're looking to expand that uh, addition, kind of as that brownish uh, EFIS type siding there. Mm -hmm. uh, over further to the west, uh, we'll still leave a few uh, docks here on the west side, and this is that white vinyl fence. Um, but they, with this, uh, how they're constructing it, does have to have an eg another exit. Um, so they're looking at a stair uh, here on the south side into Market Street. Uh, the building face is essentially the property line. Uh, they are previously approved for an encroachment for their transformer on that raised uh, concrete platform, and then they have an exit here. So this exit will pretty similarly near uh, this uh, exit there, just uh, uh, steel uh, stairs coming off the side of the building. Uh, they will be doing some work. I think they're working with right away uh, to kind of realign the driveway here uh, to allow for their uh, docks there, but uh, looking to construct. They've already started some of the work on the building, but uh, still need the encroachment to allow this exit at this location. So the encroachment is basically just a little... Just entry. this little platform and then stairs coming down into the right okay. of way. Still have, uh, I think it's 12 or 15 feet to the curb line there. Okay. Council, you have any questions? All right, moving on. Uh, number three will be a public hearing consideration of the 2020 amendment to the Burlington Urban Revitalization Plan. <laughs> so our downtown neighborhood development urban renewal area um, is shown here in blue, has been amended a couple times. Uh, a uh, number of years ago to include the Apollo school site uh, that was added in there. Um, essentially, this area qualifies for that uh, expanded tax payment program, the seven year 100% uh, and then 75, 50, 25 for residential only. Um, we've had requests from uh, YWCA right next door to City Hall here, uh, why, asking why they weren't in the building and it uh, just happened to come down 4th Street to Washington and then back up to Columbia. Um, so uh, we could fill in the void there uh, and then the properties between 4th and 8th Columbia and Washington would qualify for that abatement as well. Um, but they're looking to do some improvements up some upper story residential uh, here on this block uh, and inquired if that could be added. So that's why it's brought forward. Okay. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Jim? How long that plan is it? We updated it when the Apollo School was uh, brought in. I believe it's 2023 or 2024. So the project, so in order to... My only question, question there was how long this is good for. So for right now, the, down, the expanded tax abatement is projects are eligible if they do something with through either 2023 or 2024. This does not extend that period of time. But there is a limited window where we have a, this expanded uh, tax abatement schedule in, in place. And there will be a point in the future where there will have to be a consideration if the council wants to extend that again or not. Okay. I think it was originally through 2020 or 2021, mm -hmm. uh, two or three years that were added when we brought in the Apollo School site. Okay. So I can get that date firm to you. Okay. And so then 3A is the same motion thing. for that. Yeah. Okay. Council, do you have any questions? The only question I have is the other day we had a question from someone on the phone regarding any type of abatement for properties downtown. Those properties would actually fall within this program, correct? Okay. We, yeah, so we have, there's about a hundred block area that fits within the, within the expanded tax abatement. Uh, all of downtown, you can see here, this doesn't show, uh, to the south it's uh, to, Locust Street, and it doesn't, it's not like a straight line across, is it? It's little angles around. Uh, but this is for, re that's for residential. Uh, any property that is zoned residential is eligible for uh, se the seven years, 100%, and 
75, 50, 25 for years 8, 9, and 10 on a 10 year tax abatement schedule. This doesn't have any impact on commercial or industrial tax abatement. Okay. Those still would qualify for our standard three year 100% or Citywide. 10 year sliding scale. Okay. The commercial portion of them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next one up, resolution awarding contract for the 2019 ADA ramp improvement project. Nick McGregor. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so we did a bid letting last Tuesday where we bid the next three projects. Uh, the first up is a resolution awarding contract um, to MG Daily uh, in the amount of $110,620. Uh, for the 2019 ADA ramp improvement. Uh, so I, I, we remember we discussed the two different projects and the distinguishing factor between them. Uh, Mount Pleasant Street and the sidewalk or the ADA compliance around that is the main focus of the 2019 project. Uh, there's a couple other ramps that are included in that. Um, the engineer's estimate was uh, 102,000. The bid was 110,000. It's a little bit above, uh, but as you remember, we bid this out last uh, fall, we did change some things to meet the bidding requirements because you can't bid out the same project, um, and the price did come down quite a bit. Um, so I, we would recommend awarding to MG Daily. Okay. Any questions? Moving on to number five, the resolution awarding contract for the 2020 ADA ramp improvement project. Uh, this resolution uh, would award contract uh, to Hickey Contracting uh, for the 2020 ADA ramp improvement project in the amount of $263,521. Uh, so when we bid these two out side by side, we thought that contractors would probably bid them fairly similarly. Looking at the bid tabs, they were close. Um, they all three, we had three bidders on both projects, the same bidders. Um, so actually, it's kind of ironic that two different bidders on this project. Um, but this project includes a lot of the ADA ramp work around the, the asphalt work that we've done in the North Hill area. Uh, there's a couple other um, locations that it includes. The, the engineer's estimate on this one was $285,000. Uh, so we saw a bid at 262, which is a little bit underneath. So it kind of makes up the difference for the, the previous one. Um, the <clears throat> dollars to pay for these two programs, I should have talked about it in the 2019. The 2019, we were going to take out of the ADA program, of which we fund that with road use tax. Uh, we funded $50,000 a year in road use tax to that. Uh, we have not been very good to, to fund projects with that type of work, or they've been so minimal they haven't added up to a lot. Uh, the 2020, uh, in a conversation earlier this afternoon, may use some of the remaining funds from that ADA ramp program money uh, and then use the remainder uh, with our GO or our, our project money that we use to do the asphalt. Uh, so typically when we would have bid out an asphalt project, we would have included the ADA ramp uh, work with that, and so that cost would have all been realized through uh, RGO funding. Okay, so okay. this will, we're, we're going to look at probably trying to break that up depending on where um, where things come in at. Or what you might say is is that we'll 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 expense it where we have cash because <laughs> really we're we're uh, between those funds we're going to be using a the majority of the funds between them and we're, we just need to make sure that we don't put any of them into a deficit account. Okay. Let's Council, get, go ahead. Where's Hickey out of? Hickey okay. He does, he's done a lot of the work in town here. He did. I know, I just didn't um, know. He's doing quite a bit on, I don't know what project he's on, but yeah, we see him quite a bit mm -hmm. on stuff, especially the smaller type items. One of them they start on this. Uh, these projects will probably kick off the, some contract documentation upon award. It takes a couple of weeks by the time they get their uh, performance bonds, but I would say within the next month you should see them start working. Okay. Any further questions? All right. Uh, next up is resolution awarding a contract for the 2020 West Avenue and Gear Avenue Dow Bar Retrofit Project. Nick. Uh, the resolution here would award contract. Uh, to Iowa Civil Contracting in the amount of $414,499. Uh, this project is the Dalbar retrofit, as uh, we've discussed in the past, which is going in and um, 
saw cutting along the panels, uh, putting new dowel bars in there, pouring back, and then diamond grinding on top to make uh, the roadway more secure and smooth at the same time. Uh, the estimate on this project was $507,000, uh, so we were quite a bit underneath of that project cost. Um, so this total project cost is 507. dollars uh, West Burlington has a share of that, and I don't think it's in the memo as to what theirs is uh, versus ours, uh, but I can bring that for next week. Uh, we did an MOU. We did 112. Okay. Did he say that in there? No, but it's no. the difference between well, we contract and our share. Our share of the list is 302000 in there. Oh, yeah. That's good. Uh, so we did an MOU uh, several weeks ago describing that, and that's what that portion will talk about. So um, we used general obligation monies for that project, um, and that should be a pretty short turnaround project as far as time of uh, in the field. They want to do like a thousand bars a day, and there's four thousand and change of bars, so it will take more than four days to do the project. But I would say a couple of weeks, and they should have quite a bit of it done. Good. So. Any questions on that one? All right, number seven, a resolution approving an agreement between the City of Burlington, Iowa, and Alliant Energy Incorporated for all night lighting service on Diamond Ridge Drive. Nick. Eric, could you pull up and put that PDF up? Jess, is there anybody online? Yeah. Let's, let's take a break and find out who it is real quick while Eric's pulling that out. Hi, this is a uh, city council. Uh, would you identify yourself, uh, who's ever online, and, and if there is a particular issue you wanted to discuss? All right, we'll keep going. Thanks. Uh, so the resolution in front of you uh, would approve the uh, acceptance of two pedestal lights uh, at the end of Diamond Ridge Estates. Uh, where it butts up against Sunnyside. Uh, my memo uh, is a little bit lengthier than my typical street light type memo uh, because the, this item has a little bit more history and it is not like a typical street light type um, acceptance. Uh, so the Diamond Ridge uh, subdivision or the Hugh Holt subdivision as it was called um, was accepted, the infrastructure was accepted in 2005 um, and all the documentation that the city has on file uh, these lights were uh, not a part of that acceptance, um, nor were they in any of the preliminary plat drawings. Uh, and so we accepted all of the infrastructure and we pay and maintain for uh, the lights that are currently in there besides these pedestal lights. Um, in there I also uh, wrote about, I had some uh, communication with Alliant Energy. Um, I asked who was paying the bill. Um, Alliant, back when they were installed, uh, set up a site account. Uh, they are not metered, so they run directly from um, their wire. There's no shutoff. Uh, there's no meter. They had a flat rate back in uh, the time frame when this would have been done. They said that they set up an account in the idea that a developer or homeowners association, homeowners association uh, would be paying for the energy usage on the lights, um, but the billing for the account was never turned on, um, so there was nothing ever sent out. So Alliant has essentially been eating the costs on energizing these lights uh, for the last decade plus. Uh, and so. That's nice of them. I don't, it's, it's not a small sum of money when yeah. you think about 15 years. Um, the, the reason I, I brought this up, uh, Nick, I'm gonna jump in. I brought this up because the developer, original developer called me about it, the one lights out. And so Alliant used to maintain those lights and replace them when they were out. And when they figured out that they weren't getting paid, they're like, "Well, we need we need someone to pay the bill before we fix it." And that's why the developer called us. So, paid the bill as in the whole bill? No, that okay. well, no one was paying the monthly service. Oh, okay. So if they were paying the monthly service. They would. They do don't it. want it like arrears. No, okay. no, no, they don't want anything. Alliant doesn't Correct. want anything to do with arrears or anything like that. They just want someone assigned to pay the monthly service, and then they'll start taking care of it. So so the request is to right. accept these lights and pay for their monthly costs. Um, in order to do that, I also highlighted um, some things that would need to happen. Um, in Alliance perspective, we would need to take over ownership of the, the brick pillars, um, and then they would install and maintain the street lights. 
Uh, they had a $785 cost. I don't know what the difference between that versus a regular street light is, but that's what the cost would be on that. Um, in my memo, I discussed uh, that I would not recommend accepting the two pedestal lights um, as they're decorative in nature um, and don't add um, any street lighting benefit, especially in the immediate area. Uh, besides that, my the second reasoning is uh, they sit outside of the right of way. It would require a permanent easement uh, from the two property owners that are next to it. Um, and then we would have to accept the brick pillars. Um, it's something that um, since, I don't know, the year that it was decided upon that we moved forward with not accepting them, that these would not be something that, you know, the city of Burlington would maintain uh, the columns. No. We, have, we have others in town that we do maintain. Um, when they were put in and accepted, um, I don't know the difference between when that decision point was made moving forward. Uh, but there was lights, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and even back in, you know, the Cascade one that you asked about, um, there are lights on Greenbrier that we pay for the lights on them, but the ones that are further down on Cascade Terrace, those are actually paid for by a property owner. So those aren't, there, we have a whole list of columns and lights within the community. Yeah. Um, uh, so on Bittersweet, we do pay for the lightage on them. Uh, those lights, I don't know when they were installed. Uh, they wouldn't meet current suit off standards because they sit right on the back of curb. So the vertical clearance wouldn't even allow for them to be there. Um, there's some on Quail Ridge. Uh, we do pay and maintain for those. Um, those have been struck once. Uh, we had to hire a mason to come in and replace, replace and do a bunch of tuck pointing. And that costs us $15,000 to do that type of function. Same so. Time. I do know that the developer, because he, because we when he reached out to me, he's had to repair this pillar once before because a car hit it, and that was on him. And Alliance still didn't catch the fact they weren't billing somebody for it, which is kind of comical. I wish they would forget me once. Anyway, uh, the developer has said, and that would be something we would have to take. To, he said he would be responsible for ma maintaining the pillars, but we would have to have some kind of formal agreement on that if we were going to look at it. I, I. Don't, I would not want to accept the maintenance of the pillars, but I, I could see us accepting the light. But we'd have to see if we could get an agreement on it. The problem I have with it is what Nick has already alluded oh. to, and I'm just looking at him here on the GIS. Yep. You pull up the Google Street View, there's a perfect image on there. They provide no benefit to city street lighting, right? They're decorated. Yeah, they would not meet any suit off standard right. for lighting. They go, they to be up, they'd have down. to be yeah. at least 15 foot. Uh, they have a standard that most of the street are lights are 30. Eight or nine feet off the ground at most? Max. Yeah. Is there a homeowners association? There is not. There is not. And there are other places, um, developments that have happened kind of since this project that have decorative entry signage and lightage. And you, when you click on them, there's, you know, the Cliffwood ones is the best one that I could see. It is a separated parcel that is owned by the subdivision um, and homeowners association. Mm -hmm. And moving forward, that would be my, you know, we also have this set of subdivision guidelines that we need to update. And some of the lighting is, it's it's kind of a sticky wicket on, you could go from lumen levels, um, but we think that we can come up with a better answer than that. Those type of entry things is something that a homeowners association um, is a better function to, to pay and maintain those. Yeah, I, I think part of where this, this this thing has existed for a while, and I think part of where he's at, he just wants an answer so he can go forward. And so that's that's why I reached out on it. Uh, you know, I I think yes, we could make we could really save ourselves a lot of these discussions about lights and these developments if we had some standards, uh, because it seems like this is a con in the short time we've been on council, it's, it it comes up on these developments as far as what kind of lights we're going to accept and, and what we have. So that would be something that would be a goal. Well, I think the overlying mm -hmm. um, message just needs to be that if we're going to accept a light it has to be a light that serves a purpose of lighting an area not, not so much decorative. as decorative yep. I mean you can get lights that do that that are decorative but I think all the ones that we've talked about they've either been too high or too low they're not bright enough um, they're just not efficient you know street Jefferson lighting. Street has decorative lighting yeah. but they're put together tightly enough and the corridor allows for that lighting to 
emulate off the roadway. So it's it's they have their function in certain places where they have purpose. It's just man, as luck would have it, they're going to be changed to something well, better. Hopefully, a little bit different. Yeah, but, but still, yeah. Well, I, so what's the, what's what staff's recommendation is? To not I would accept. not recommend accepting them as okay. a streetlight. Does uh, anybody have any questions for Nick? Anna? Okay, well, we'll see what happens at City Council. Uh, next one up, proposed consent agenda. For the consent agenda, first one is resolution approving final acceptance, final payment, and release of retention monies for the 2019 Seal Code Street Resurfacing Project. Uh, this has taken a little while to get some of the punch list items just when it uh, kind of finished off last fall. Uh, some of the concrete work with a couple of intakes couldn't get done. Uh, but this is a final payment. It would allow um, authorization for final payment in the amount of $9,096 to pro paving. Um, and it would release the retention monies of $13,201. Uh, our total as built costs, uh, I did not ask him before I left. I don't think it includes the engineering on that. Uh, it was bid out at 274000 and change. Uh, total as-built costs, uh, we actually had a quantity adjustment change on the lesser value. We estimated it higher uh, than what it actually came in at, so $264,000. Uh, road use tax funds, uh, for is, it funds our annual seal coat project. Uh, so it, it was a pretty good project. There's no reason to uh, not recommend okay. approval on that. Questions? All right, number two. Resolution approving the purchase of permanent easement of the 2021 Harrison Avenue reconstruction project. Uh, the resolution in front of you uh, would approve a permanent easement with a property owner off of Dunham. Um, and, and it is highlighted, I think, in the following documentation as to uh, Mr. Harty. I think that's how you say his name. Harty. Uh, Harty. And the amount of $5,550. $5, uh, for the permanent easement. Uh, and this is necessary to be able to run uh, the storm line where we are taking, and I've, I think I've described this in the past, the storm water from Harrison currently in a lot of cases uh, goes into intakes that hits our combined sewer system on the south uh, basin. Uh, what we would be doing with this project is installing new storm intakes and actually taking it to the south. Uh, we've had conversations with the school, uh, but right now, the permanent easement in front of you is the most important because it allows us to get across from Dunham to the south uh, just immediately to where James Madison School is. There's some wooded property off to the east of there. Uh, so this is the most important factor of getting us there. Um, there's some fence and trees in the area. Uh, this easement isn't out of line as far as costs. Uh, they would not be able to build on that easement. I'll, I'll bring an actual aerial map. I didn't realize that that didn't get put in the packet. Okay. It doesn't really show you a whole lot, just seeing a, a plating. Um, no, I see. And you will have a follow-up at some point. Yes. The school system uh, staff has been in conversations with them for a while about putting a retainage pond on that property to the east of James Madison, and they are more than amenable to doing that. So uh, we just want to get this process started, and then we will uh, we'll be getting that moving here over the next couple of you know, weeks should happen. Um, we actually have a meeting on Thursday to go over this project uh, with our consultants on okay. it. So. Questions? None. Yes, did you have one? No. Oh, okay. Number three, resolution approving professional service agreement with Klinger and Associates to perform phase two of the environmental set, site adjust, assessment. Jeez. Uh, the, the city of Burlington hired Klinger and Associates to do a phase one environmental, uh, which is a desktop type, type activity uh, to research uh, the environmental concerns associated with the parcel. Uh, the parcels in mind uh, are the former ideal concrete site just off of Angular and Main Street. Uh, the hopes, uh, and we don't have any of the engineering done on this process yet, would be to install a new Angular lift station. Uh, we believe that it could help uh, relieve some of the flow coming to the Market Street lift station down on the riverfront. Um, and also could be uh, a part of a, a new process, uh, you know, with an EQ basin and whatnot. So uh, hiring Klingner would involve uh, doing some soil borings to confirm, uh, to understand what our environmental liability would be to purchase the property. I've spoken with the property owner representative on this, knowing that this was being talked about. Um, there isn't, you know, m major environmental happenings there, 
but I want to at least explain what's going on, that there is enough concern as in a city we should, you know, do our due diligence and figure out uh, what kind of liabilities there are with the property. So uh, the cost for cleaner to do these soil borings is $10,200. Um, it's expensive type of work, but it can help you in the long run from a liability uh, to, to know what you're getting into. So, so if we proceed uh, with this, and that does look like it would work, the, the, the plan would be to do that lift station the same time we're doing the Main Street work, or no? No, it would be a future project. Um, I, I don't know the time frame and, and you know what that would look like okay. five plus years from now. Okay, all right. I, uh, I don't remember reading about that in the sewer master plan. Is it something that was in our sewer master it is, plan? It is not something that was in the sewer master plan. Um, what kind of impact would it have on our sewer master plan? I would definitely, th it, would, it would alter it, but it could also alleviate some of the conversations of improvements and upgrades to the Market Street lift station. Yeah. I think it's two and a half million gallons per day mm -hmm. that come through the angular flow. And if you could redirect that during heavy rain events, you might be able to to shift. To um, I shouldn't be the guy talking about this. I mean, Don should be as far as what would happen to the Market Street lift station. But it could definitely shift the, the burden um, and allow market to handle more flow. Um, th there's some conversations at the plant. It's a bigger nut to crack than just one lift station and one site. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't in the master plan at that time. We weren't really looking at doing that. We were looking at separation. And that separation didn't necessarily involve that uh, because you would eliminate the CSO outfall where, you know, after a certain rain event, that water exits out into the river. So we, with this in mind, moving forward with our consent order, which we're moving forward with, it would add a wrinkle to that, I guess. Well, so we would, we would likely do the lift station. I mean, my thing is I just don't want to invest money into doing something that we don't have a bunch of intent would on doing. We've, we own a couple of other properties along the Main Street corridor, mm -hmm. and as we've had that in there, we haven't known exactly where they're going to fit into our plans, but they give us some flexibility. As he mentioned, not only are we talking about a, a, an alter, a separate lift station that may change the dynamics of what we do with the other one, um, but we're, we've been discussing where do you put equalization tanks through that area, too. Mm -hmm. And that's for the same type of purpose. How do you sure. how do you bring down the, the flow that goes through either one of those? Um, we don't have uh, plans uh, for what we're going to do, but the more properties that give us some options in there that can be bought at a cheap price, and that's what we're looking at here. This is a fairly cheap lot. It gives us some options as we do those uh, it's do some of those hydrology models down the yeah. road. And we, yeah. we don't know. We may end up not needing it, but it gives us flexibility on projects that are multi-million dollars to sure. spend this kind of money to have that. I, it just, we, we see a benefit to at least have that as options for when we do do those designs down the road. And now is when we have that option in an area that we know that we need flexibility. Uh, we don't know that we're going to actually use it, but it gives us that flexibility in the future. You know, it's, it's prudent to take advantage of opportunities, so I'm, I'm fine with it. Any other questions, Council? No? no? Okay. I think it's a good idea. Good. Uh, next step is resolution of authorizing the filing of an application for Iowa Department of Transportation's State Recreational Trails application for construction of the Flint River Trail located in the city of Burlington, Iowa. Mr. Tislin. This is the remaining portion of Flint River Trail um, from the dead end, uh, just uh, south of the Lamont, former Lamont parking lot uh, there on Bluff Road, uh, kind of at the bottom part of the screen, uh, would connect up along the east side of Bluff Road uh, to the north on Cash Street. Uh, you can see the trail on the north side of Cash Street is existing. Uh, that wraps around behind Case on the levee, uh, goes north towards Tamer Road and then back towards Mill Dam Road. Uh, currently, the trail is complete from that portion on the bottom uh, on Bluff Road uh, to the riverfront, um, fully paved. Uh, so this is kind of the last remaining section. Uh, currently, people have to get on road or go through the ditch or get on 8th Street or find another way uh, through that connection. Uh, we have 
been working with the Regional Planning Commission in Des Moines County. Uh, Des Moines County was allocated some funds through the regional tap uh, that they're unable to use, and uh, so we're trying to work with those funds before those expire. Um, looking at applying, or did apply for a Walmart grant as well to use as local match. Uh, looking to apply for a refund this fall as well for local match uh, to try and build up our uh, local match amounts uh, for this project. Uh, uh, we have 25,000 uh, allocated from the city. Uh, looking at a $439,000 project um, using 25,000 city funds and then other funds as match for the project, but uh, would substantially complete this uh, trail section. Um, and uh, I think uh, yeah, grants are due in early July, and uh, this is what, roughly 1,000, 1,200 uh, lineal feet of trail to be remaining. Uh, tough portion there at the Flint Cliffs Manufacturing. It would go down to about an eight-foot section there. There's just not much right away. It is a, a kind of a, a retaining wall there and getting on top of that. Uh, but feel this is uh, I guess pretty critical point mm -hmm. or portion of the trail to get completed. So. Questions? No, but I, I will say that I enjoy this trail and I love it. And uh, I think it's a, definitely something that's good for Burlington. If you haven't been out there yet, you should check it out. It's, it's a great trail. You can bike or run or whatever you want on it. Okay, uh, moving on to number five, resolution approving the Greater Burlington Bicycle and Pedestrian Plan 2020. So we have uh, some individuals from regional planning. I'll pull up the presentation um, that prepared the plan. This was, uh, I guess, spearheaded by the Southeast Iowa Regional Planning Commission, uh, jointly with West Burlington, City of Burlington, and Des Moines County. Uh, the city uh, previously, City Planning Commission, uh, a few years ago had uh, updating the bike and pedestrian plan as one of their priorities that they sent to council um, and uh, started working on it, kind of started and stopped uh, with Charlie leaving and then some turnover in staff and uh, regional planning had some funds to bring this forward uh, and they've gone through quite a public input process and background process over the last year or so. Uh, so I'll pull that up and then we'll have a couple of representatives from regional planning go through a brief okay. presentation. Hi, sir. I just wanted to check if you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Eric kind of introduced the plan, but I am um, conscious of already. I am a regional planner with Southeast Iowa Regional Planning Commission, and I have um, our other regional planner from our office, Stephen Strasky, and I will go ahead and let him introduce himself before I get started. Hello, uh, my name is Steven Sharetsky. I'm a regional planner with Thursday. Uh, I've been there about two years and I've been working on this plan um, since we got started with it, I think in July, August of last year. Um, we presented this plan back in uh, 2019, seems like a long time now, but on August 19th is when we came down to the council, um, kind of presented the plan, and I can only remember we've not even done the um, public meeting by then. So we were hoping to do one um, in the following weeks, and we've come a long way since then. Uh, this plan was last done in 2013, um, and we've been working on updating that plan since a lot has been accomplished by the city uh, of Burlington, West Burlington, and the one county since the last plan. Um, so um, one thing that I wanted to point out was we know this is an unfortunate situation that we're going through during this pandemic situation, but uh, one thing that all of us have noticed uh, for sure is that more people are getting out of their homes, um, you know, on their bikes and walking more because you have more leisure time now at this point. So that kind of um, makes the timing for this plan to get adopted by the city kind of, you know, in that ballpark in the situation where we are right now. So we move on to the next slide where I'm going to talk about what we are going to present today and talk a little more on. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about the purpose of the plan, why there's need of this plan, um, and then kind of delve into the vision statement that we have for this plan. Um, and then we'll talk briefly, not a whole lot, but we'll talk briefly on public input process that we did um, for this plan. It was a very comprehensive public input process that we did. And then um, last but not least, we'll be talking about recommendations uh, that we want to make for both the city and the county um, and the uh, proposed networks that we will be talking about come from you know, both the city and the public. 
um, and kind of aligns with um, a lot of ongoing projects that are going in the area. Um, just wanted to refresh our memories here about what this plan is and what it entails. Um, so this is a strategic plan. When we say strategic plan, it means it's not a comprehensive plan that would have like a 20, 25 year timeline. We're looking at more of a five to 10 year timeline and kind of focusing on um, you know, building sidewalks, it could be white sidewalks or trails, um, you know, any kind of on-road bicycle infrastructure or off-road that we want to see in greater Burlington area. So we want to establish through this plan kind of those priorities that would help create that safe, connected, and easily accessible network um, of these all these facilities within greater Burlington area. Another point that I wanted to kind of point out with the purpose and the need of the plan is, um, you know, of course, the city is always speaking for, you know, any kind of private, state, or local, um, or federal funds for projects like these, for any kind of bike and pedestrian improvements in the area. Um, and um, this is always a good idea to kind of refer plans like this um, when you are seeking those funds, any kind of grant applications that the city is going for. Um, like we were just talking about uh, state track trails or Flint River trails, you know, this, this plan that would get adopted real soon here um, could make um, a very strong point within that grant application when it goes to the state. You know, there's a reference to the plan that kind of states, um, you know, why this is a priority. Flint River Trail has been talked about quite a bit in the plan, and we talk more about this, even we'll kind of go more into depth with, into that. Um, but it's always a good idea to refer to plans like this. Uh, one interesting thing was that um, uh, we managed the surface transportation block grant applications, uh, which is a federal uh, money from uh, from uh, from DOD, um, and they did submit. The city actually had an application to us come through, uh, which was um, putting a sidewalk on Summer Street, going from Costner up to Linwood, where it can be that, um, and that got approved, got scored well. Um, so just to give an example about you know how times like this could be of real importance going forward and seeking funds. Um, this vision statement is again um, coming from the public, from the cities and the county. Um, and like I said, there would be a five to ten year timeline. So we're focusing on a creating a timeline for ten years. So we said by 2030, we want to see Greater Burlington as a place where its bicycle and pedestrian system would be not just easily accessible to the residents of the Greater Burlington area, but also visitors. We have so many visitors that come in for tourism and just to you know make use of all these uh, recreational assets that we have in the community. So we want to make sure that you know all these facilities are easily accessible to all the population, you know whether they are from the area or not. I kind of mentioned this about the public input process, and I'll kind of delve more into this here. Um, you know, we did, we had a steering committee kind of established. Uh, we had six to seven people on this committee that we kind of reached out and kind of established ourselves. Um, and uh, they have been engaged throughout the process. We met one on one with them. We sent them drafts to look at, um, you know, provide any kind of feedback they have, and they've been really engaged in the process. Um, apart from that, we've had stakeholder meetings, kind of one-on-one -on -one meetings, and we really want to thank here um, Eric has, has been from the city, Catherine Dice, um, Nick McGregor, and then um, Jesse Howe, because we sat, you know, with them one-on-one -on -one in one room and kind of went through all the priorities that we had, you know, kind of understanding what kind of projects the city has um, on the horizon and what we should be um, establishing as a priority going into the future. So we, we really want to thank uh, the city to kind of helping us out and guiding us through the process. Um, we've had two public meetings um, since we met the last time. Uh, one was for uh, the city of Burlington, which was at the library, and we had a great response. Um, in the meeting, we had 40 plus people show up, lots of bikers, walkers, and just people you know, really engaged in recreational activities in the community. They all showed up, and we really want to give a huge shout out to Linda Marie. She showed up, and um, you know she represented the uh, skateboarding community, um, and it was really nice to see familiar faces, you know, come down and actually, um, you know, see the importance of this plan. And they really had a lot of feedback to share with us. 
Um, for those who couldn't make to the public meetings, we still wanted to give them a chance to provide us feedback and um, you know, look at all the priorities and see what they see of important going in the future. So we created an area-wide survey um, and we had 246 um, responses in total, which is you know, a significant number for a community of 25,000 um, in Burlington. And we kind of analyzed all this input that we got from the steering committee, from the stakeholder meetings, from all the public meetings and the survey. Um, we, we sat down and kind of looked at all of this and came up with all the recommendations. And I will let Stephen talk more about all the recommendations, short term and long term, going ahead. Well, thank you, Kancha. Um, so based upon all of our public input process that we went through our conversations with stakeholders, um, a couple of themes became apparent to us. There was um, quite a lot of interest in connecting um, our existing resources, our existing trails or multi-use paths, whichever term you wish to use, um, and also working towards building a loop around the community, um, something um, the successful communities such as Fairfield, uh, Stanton, and Mount Pleasant's working on kind of building a loop around the city. Um, we know that, you know, that's quite an endeavor, that's quite on the long-term vision, but we wanted to work towards connecting our existing parts and getting ourselves closer to getting a loop around the community over the longer term. Um, we'll go in, in the next slide, we'll go into what specifics to Barlington, but to give you um, Eric, Eric, if you can go back one slide. Um, just to give you an overview of what's going on uh, more broadly, um, the darker darker orange is the existing multi-use paths for those that are programmed to be completed. Um, the yellow is what we're proposing in this plan. Um, the darker green is the existing bike lanes on, on Mount Pleasant Street in this program for Mount for in the south of the community and the uh, uh, light green is the um, proposed bike lanes and you can see just a tiny bit of Flint River Trail we just talked about with the state rec trails up on Bluff Road uh, remains to be completed within Burlington. Uh, we're working towards connecting our existing amenities such as connecting the up from SCC down to Grayville Network Park um, I kind of build those connections between destinations that um, will also help, helps to contribute towards the loop, um, connecting our parks uh, to the downtown and will be helped out considerably with Tiger extending the riverfront trail to Angular, um, so working towards getting, getting that segment completed. And you can kind of see up north of town, I'm working on getting the final segment of Flint River Trail completed, um, that'll be through Moyne County Conservation. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, specific to Burlington, uh, we came up with a set of nine priorities for the community to address over the next five to ten years. Um, these were put together based on um, public input, advice from the steering committee, staff, and various other um, priority, priority uh, meetings and discussions. Um, so the number one priority was the completion of the Flint River Trail within Burlington, as you just heard about with the State Rep Trails application. Um, you know, this will connect to the, the little segment up along by a case on Bluff Road. Um, the second priority was the uh, completion of the bike lane along Mount Pleasant Street. Um, there's quite a lot of potential to get that done and it will help to establish help to make that a useful corridor for biking and I'm getting across the northern sector of the community. Our third item was completion of the Mason Road multi-use path um, to Summer Street. Um, since we, I think anyone who's driven past there um, since that was completed last year can attest to seeing so many people out and about and using it. Um, and I think getting it extended into the neighborhoods will help to give people more access to um, that trail. Uh, the fourth priority was the multi-use path um, along Harrison, a Harrison Avenue um, that would connect between Summer and Main Street that would help to build towards a loop in the community while also giving uh, neighborhoods more access to 
biking to that street facilities. Uh, the fifth priority would be um, getting across from Summer Street to Dankwood Park. You know, we're having those sidewalks will be completed on Costner to Linwood, and getting access across would be a huge resource and advantage to getting more residents involved in these facilities. Our sixth priority was getting a multi use path along Main Street um, from Angular, which will be the extent of the Tiger improvements down to Dankwood Park. Um, that would help to connect our downtowns to the parks. And I mean, there's definitely people who come to the visitor center to, you know, run out bikes and things. And this would really help to um, connect these two popular destination points. And it would also extend the effective length of the Flint River Trail um, down all the way throughout Burlington. Um, the Seventh item was a multi-use path along Sunnyside Avenue um, between the schools. It would help with, you know, kids being able to go between the schools to meet up with their siblings or their parent guardians. It would also give um, some form of pedestrian and bicycle amenities to the far north side of the community uh, that's uh, kind of being overlooked um, in terms of these improvements thus far. Um, the eighth item would be um, along Summer Street, extending multi-use path or sidewalk down from where it ends, just about by the airport property uh, to Linwood. Um, that would um, really help to connect the improvements the city is already doing from Linwood on south. Um, it would give you know people more access to the parks and to the um, main part of the community. And the final part would be um, multi-use path along Main Street from Harrison all the way to Dankwood Park over the Cascade Crossing. Um, depending on what that turns out into being, um, we think this would be a vital pedestrian connection um, in fulfilling our Parks to Downtown initiative while um, also reopening that corridor. And all of our priorities, we did put them in a numerical order, but it is up, it is up to um, it is up to the city council and the city about which projects it would want to address um, in order. And then, so looking toward these are all short-term goals that we discussed over the next five to ten years, but we wanted to put together a longer-term vision um, for beyond ten years to ten years and beyond. Uh, I wanted, as Concha alluded to earlier, um, one of the key things in securing grant funding is having something in a planning document and a long-term plan. And you know, you never know with you know how things are going. There all, could always be future infrastructure funding. Um, and we wanted to make sure that some of the longer-term goals that came up through our public input process and through our discussions with stakeholders were included. Um, as you can see, it's, we're kind of working towards the loop around the community, um, connecting the Flint River Trail in the north, our, our trails along the riverfront down to the parks, and then along the south to Hunt Woods. Um, that would create an effective loop that has proved so attractive and desirable to other communities in the state, um, including Fairfield and Stanton. Um, looking at um, expanding some bike and pedestrian facilities um, within town more than we have been already, such as possibly along Division or Curran, uh, connecting, you know, through Osborne um, down into downtown, um, working, finding a sidewalk or multi-use path or something along the periphery of Roosevelt Avenue potentially um, to connect those shopping, you know, resorts, shopping and employment centers uh, to the community more than it already does. Um, and none of this stuff is items that we are proposing in the short term um, that the community work on. So we wanted to make sure that there's some documentation and some thought put into this and also in case any other future funding sources are available. And I think with that, um, we were, we we're very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, we have our contact information there. and. We're kind of in and out of the office right now, so feel free to send us an email and we can give you a call back if you want to speak to us uh, more directly. Okay, Council, do you have any questions? 
Seeing none, I thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, next we're going to set a date for public hearing July 6, 2020, consideration of the sale of property locally known as 114 Harrison Street, Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. And there will be a consideration of an ordinance amending section 73.04, special speed restrictions on of chapter 73 speed regulations of the Burlington Municipal Code. So I look forward to those. Uh, discussion item, uh, Major Klein, rotating towing agreement. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mark. As I'm sure you're aware, as part of our daily operations, we often utilize towing services for uh, motor vehicle accidents, abandoned vehicles, uh, snow routes in order to get street routes cleared for the Public Works Department. Currently, we have a towing contract in place with Mike Campbell's Body Shop. That contract comes to an end on June 30th. In past years, we had had rotating towing agreements with other towing services in town, and uh, we have opted to return to that rotating towing agreement. In the past, we have not had anything uh, specific in writing. It was simply a word of mouth agreement that we would contact local towing services on a rotating basis. Uh, in past times, we had difficulties with response time for various record services, uh, the level of professionalism provided, uh, which led to us or coming to an agreement with Campbell's in this contract. Uh, in returning to a towing rotation and agreement, we wanted something more concrete on paper that was not a contract, but rather an agreement between those towing services and the department, so they understood what our expectations are. Uh, as a department, if we are recommending these organizations, we feel it's incumbent upon them to act in a professional manner as they are acting with us in any of those times. Uh, I had previously emailed a, a copy of that agreement to the council and also brought hard copies for your review tonight. Uh, Chief Kramer asked if I would uh, stop by and see if there were any questions, comments, concerns that any of the council had regarding this proposed agreement. Anybody with any thoughts or concerns? How many organizations are there locally that provide towing services too? Right. Right now, in addition to Mike Campbell's, there are two others, Beckman's Towing Service and Jim Jack's and Body Shop. Jim, okay. They all charge the same major? Pretty, clo pretty we, close. We with, yeah, agreement with a relative that's amount, same. correct. Okay. Will you have some type of formal reporting if you hear complaints from yeah. Yes, people? that is why we wanted to lay this out in written form. What we'll do is the packet that you have will be provided to the towing services themselves. The owners will initial each page so that we're aware that they have read it. And then they'll sign the affidavit on the file or on the rear page so that we're aware or they're aware what our expectations are. Uh, we also provide for sanctions that may arise based on what you're saying now. If we receive an inordinate amount of complaints, we can suspend the towing service for a period of time and we can conduct a review to see if that's someone that the city wishes to continue to represent them in this fashion. Sounds good. Sounds like you've thought of everything. That's Thank you. Fair. Yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied. Anybody else got a question? Yeah, read it. Look good. Thanks for saying Thank you, Council. Thank you, sir. Okay, next uh, discussion point is Perkins Park House. Mr. Tislin. Similar memo in the packet as before. Uh, majority got through the House. Uh, staff's recommendation remains uh, we'd recommend demolition of the structure uh, based on the ability to incorporate it into the park. Um, the rehab cost and time and management necessary to maintain it. Um, yes, we feel that the land could be better incorporated into the park instead of fenced off from public access. And then with the summer camp uh, and the Perkins Shelter houses used throughout the year, um, we would not recommend leasing or subleasing the property. Do realize the home isn't in as bad a condition as a lot of properties in town. Uh, but it is in a park unlike most other properties in town and it does represent the city and then our use of the park uh, wholly for the camp and for shelter rentals and just year-round use so that's our recommendation i know some of you have different views or but you've seen the home now as well and kind of seen the condition and it was bad enough yeah. that's my view <laughs> it was it was pretty nasty um you know, what, what do you think, Council? Got any questions for Eric, or let's hear your thoughts. Um, I think I may be in the minority, but I'm not a fan of tearing it down at this point. And, and the reason is, um, so we had a local gentleman who is with an uh, NGO locally, uh, Hope Haven, um, that walked through the home a week ago, right? Yeah, no, we, uh, we probably like last Tuesday. 
Um, and they, and I got an email from him today. It sounds like they have interest in perhaps leasing it from us. They would do all of the rehab work. They would take care of all of the grounds. Um, and I'm not saying that's the perfect option. We haven't gotten to that point to even figure out what that would look like, but I would like to give them time to figure out if it is an option and what it would look like before we decide to tear it down. So okay. He stated it'd be about two months at least before they, looking at grants and different things, put something together. Yeah, it would take a little bit of time, but my position has, right? has been for a while is that uh, um, there's just there's not a lot of great housing in this community, we, and we have a lot of people who need a lot of housing. Um, I hate to start demoing how I understand it's in a park and it's not a perfect situation, but when we have a lot of people who are needing places to stay, I don't like the idea of tearing down a home that, in my opinion, wouldn't require that much work to get back, uh, back to a considerable way. I'm, I'm cool with giving them time to check it out. So I mean, we, you know, I, I definitely am not for selling it uh one we'd be in violation of the deed and then all of a sudden anybody else that would wish to give to uh, bequeath us some land or property might think twice about that so but i'm definitely okay with giving uh, an organization like hope haven who has proven time and time again they're they're pretty successful i'm okay with giving them a couple months i mean it's not gonna get any really any no. worse it's definitely not gonna get any better but we have to mow it I wish it was historically significant, but I do think that it is worthy of saving. Once it's gone, it's gone, and 10 years in the future, we must, oh gosh, that'd be perfect for, because we really don't know sometimes what the future holds, and I, I still think we, that it could have yeah. a, a, a great purpose somewhere down the line, but just again, not right now. we got to make sure that whatever they want to do is something that works for us, so we may get back here in two months yeah, and find out that it won't, it. and we tear it down. But I think it's a good idea, and I think it's worth pursuing. So. We'll just have to have, we might have to have some written agreements on that. Any other questions? No questions. No questions. Okay. Uh, next up, my PC is out. Linda, maybe you can read it. The appointments? Yes. We have two appointments. For the Housing Appeals Board, we are looking at uh, current commission member Sid Carter expiring June 6th, 15th, rather. And he's expressed interest in serving again for another five-year term. So we would like to reappoint Sid Carter and appreciate his service. And then on the low rent housing board, we have commission member Edward Prill. His term expires. Actually, it did expire in March. And Robert, how do you pronounce Bob it? Bob Madsen. Oh, thank Bob you. Madsen. Bob Madsen has expressed interest in serving on this committee. And so we're going to review his application, and we look forward to appointing him for a two-year term. Okay. And then... Yes. Just want to point out, we included his application material, just an email from Dan Eberhard, just so you could note he is somebody who has, as a landlord, has participated uh, in the Section 8 program, so there are some interconnections there. Uh, Dan's comfortable with that, but just wanted to make sure that you noted that there are some interconnections okay. there. So I've never served on that board. Does that board approve the Section 8 uh, permits? The, the housing? My so, like, I mean, they don't my have like any concern was, side of that, do they? No. no? Okay. okay. They, 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 their, their site, their, their sole responsibility is management of our facility mm -hmm. there. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, anything else on that, Jim? No? No, no. I just wanted to make sure that you noted that there, yeah. there are interconnections. Okay. And, and so you, you do need to understand them, but there, it's, it shouldn't be something that is an issue, but you do okay. need to, to note it in case because you may get comments from the public too. In Burlington, Iowa, everything's interconnected. <laughs> uh, next up, Don, fully automated truck and trash can cart update. Last but not least, my friend. Don't, don't let them get to you. Um, with all uh, seriousness, though, yeah. um, I would um, not be offended if uh, any of the department representatives would like to leave at this point. Seriously. I got you. I mean, I'm going to make this presentation, It's, mm -hmm. uh, but it may not be of any interest or serve purpose. So without... I'm serious. You can leave if you'd like to leave. I, I, I won't be offended in any way. You sat through it. 
You sat through theirs, Don. Yeah. Don, no, there's yeah. not really 46 slides on this, is there? Oh, yes, there is. Okay. <laughs> I hope they're all as good as this one. Okay, so, yeah, first slide, uh, that's my introduction. Uh, lids fully closed. And recycling. Recycling is a very, very important part of the handling of solid waste in the city of Burlington as it is surrounding communities. And uh, we encourage people to participate in the curbside recycling that's available to them. They're paying for it on their trash bill. Uh, and then, of course, they have a 24-7 drop-off at the recycling center itself. And um, it can be very beneficial in enabling you to uh, get your lid on your cart fully closed. Next slide. Okay, this is just a, an update. Uh, the uh, city-owned wheeled trash cart program uh, got started in uh, November, October, November of 2018. And uh, the uh, city council wanted to have three sizes of carts available for choice. And as you can see in currently, uh, the number of 35 gallon, the number of 65 gallon, and the number of 95 gallon carts we have out in our community. And you can see in the far right the changes since the beginning. We have 224 35 gallon carts sitting in our inventory or storage area, which is out at the armory. Uh, and that number just goes up week after week, month after month. So, so I do not see those carts being brought back into the program unless somebody becomes inventive or something like that. That's just carts that are not being used. Is there any chance to sell those, you think? They have a it has logo city on logo it. on it. I don't know if they put a label on it or something like that. I've not researched that. Okay. Next slide. Thanks. Okay, again, it was a city council that wanted to have the options. I believe a couple, one or more of our councilmen went to uh, the Quad Cities. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it was Davenport, yep. uh, but they had three carts and they liked the program that they saw there. Staff was recommending going with one size, one size fits all. Um, I just wanted to show this uh, slide because, uh, well, the trash cart exchanges are the exchanges that normally would be $35 if they wanted to make that exchange. That very, very large number in that first 12 month period encompasses a three week period where they allowed a grace period where you said no fees to be collected for the exchange. A lot of people took advantage of that three week period. But uh, from May of 2019 uh, through April of uh, this current year, we've had 55 customers that have said, yes, I'm willing to pay $35 to change the size of my cart. Uh, the trash cart, the new accounts, that would be someone who builds a house, never had a cart there moves into a house that they just purchased that has a cart size that they uh, do not want, they want to change to something else. So as long as they do that within the first 30 days, we let them make that exchange at no cost to them. Uh, if it's an apartment where the apartment dweller is the one that pays the water bill that has the trash account on it, they are allowed to, again, within the first 30 days to make that exchange to a different size cart. So there's 341 in this last 12 month period. Additional carts, uh, with that, if you add those two numbers together, that's how many households approximately uh, have more than one cart. Mm -hmm. They've asked for an additional cart. Um, total cart work orders, uh, the first 12 months, 766. Uh, the next 12 months, 454. Uh, we're averaging probably somewhere between 9 and 10 carts per week per uh, throughout the entire year. Some months more activity, some months less activity. But the fact that we went with three different size carts means if you're going to increase the service level and meet the customer's needs, it typically means more work for the supplier of those services. And as it indicates, uh, we're taking calls, making calls, processing exchange fees, filling out selection forms, updating the account information, inventory of three sizes, tracking them. Uh, every cart that we exchange, 
we have to bring back and we end up having to wash it out and clean it up. And let me tell you, some of the carts out there are pretty nasty. Some of the carts we brought back are not reusable as far as going out to a customer. We've gotten to the point now where we're beginning to, if we notice it when we pick it up, we charge the customer for that cart because the cart is not reusable and we've lost the value of that cart. What are some of those, I mean, the cart's damaged? Uh, they've, or? They've, they've used the cart to uh, mix cement in, oh my God. Uh, maybe mix paint, some kind of chemicals. <laughs> uh, they're just, just, or they've painted the outside of the carts where we've tried to get the paint off. I mean, we've spent hours on a cart trying to clean it up. Um, so the point is, is that uh, we're spending a lot of time dealing with three size carts. If we had one size, no one would be having to call and say, well, I'd like to change size. We wouldn't have to go out and exchange it or anything like that. We estimate that we're spending somewhere between 16 and 20 hours a week when you add both in the field time, people going out and making the exchanges, coming back and cleaning the carts, and then of course, there's the office people at the water department. There's the office people here at City Hall are doing the uh, exchange fees. And then there, of course, my uh, office coordinator at the plant who's taking the calls and dealing with three size carts. So there was a cost associated with that. But I'm sure that from the citizen standpoint, they like the option of being able to choose the size cart that they want. Next slide. So the council's goal, one of the council goals was to reduce trash related nuisances, thinking that by going to the cart, um, and I was one that felt that way too, that it, that would help reduce the number of trash related nuisances. Uh, my crew members call the office and have us relay to the nuisance department when we feel a nuisance exists. First 12 months, we made 252 contacts with the nuisance department. In the next 12 months, we were down to 236, which for all practical purposes is the same number of calls. I don't know if Eric, you got any com you had any comments as far as what the crew feels pertaining to trash nuisances, but uh, that's what the numbers show that we, the calls that we've made. Next slide. So at, once we had the carts, we upgraded our existing rear loaders uh, with tippers to enable us to handle the carts. And the next question was, do we make a step forward to go to a fully automated program or do we stay with a semi-automated? Next slide. In the semi-automated program, you have your rear loaders with the uh, cart tippers. Um, it's slower than manual collection, manual collection being where they pick up the can or pick up the bag and toss it into the hopper. When you do it manually, you can efficiently use the space that's available in the hopper before you run the packer cycle. Uh, with the carts, they dump right there, it just kind of cones up and you take up maybe less than, maybe a third of the hopper space and then you're cycling that blade. So you get more wear and tear, it takes more time because you're cycling it more often. Realizing that after using them for a while, uh, when I came to the council, I said, well, are we going to stay manual or semi-auto or do we want to go to uh, step up to a fully automated program, a hybrid program? If we're going to stay with semi-manual uh, or semi-auto semi collection, then I, want, I was asking for an additional person to add to the department to help make up for the lost time that was taken doing the semi-auto. And in fact, most programs that have semi-auto collection have at least a two-man crew, and in many communities they have a three-man crew. So I asked for an extra person. Next slide. In the fully automated program, that's where you've got that mechanical arm with the claw, and that type of program does have pluses. Uh, you're supposed to be able to pick up more households in the same amount of time um, that, uh, that's served by the, uh, in comparison to semi-auto. Uh, routinely on a fully automated truck, you only have one operator on that truck and that person remains in the cab. Uh, what we have found thus far is that more houses uh, in the same amount of time has not really developed. It's not, we've not, we're not seeing it as of yet 
and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, next slide, minuses. Uh, the purchase price of the truck was more than a rear loader. Um, the maintenance cost we really haven't gotten into because everything has been warranty. Uh, property damage, we have had some property damage with that mechanical arm grabbing something that takes time for the person to learn the nuances and improve their skills and dealing with it. We've popped a couple of uh, mailboxes off their posts and sent them flying through the air. Um, we've, uh, I don't believe we've struck any vehicles yet. Um, I think we did some damage to a garage, that type of thing. Uh, the truck is uh, less maneuverable because typically it's a little bit bigger truck than what your uh, rear loaders are. Next slide. Some additional minuses. Uh, we have uh, the truck weighs more. It's a commercial truck. It weighs more. We try to compensate by putting larger tires to have a <coughs> weight distribution, improve the weight distribution of the truck. Uh, the downtime, since we only have one fully automated truck, if we were to come to rely on that truck picking up X number of households every single day and it goes down, we had a significant maintenance issue, well then you've got to make that up with a slower process using your manual semi-auto collection. Uh, efficiency is reliant on the customer and the cooperation of the customer, cooperation of the neighbor, and the lay of the land, the streetscape. Uh, alley set out locations have been changed to curbside at 91 properties. We've sent out 91 letters. People generally don't like change. I have fielded a few telephone calls from customers who weren't really, really happy about making that set out location change. Uh, if carts are on both sides of the alley, which they typically are in the city of Burlington, then in order to pick up both sides, if you're picking up in the alley, you have to drive up and down that alley twice. There are a few communities, not many that I know of, that require the customers on one side of the alley to move their cart to the other side for their collection day so they're all in a nice straight row. And that significantly improves the efficiency of the operation. But again, it's an inconvenience to the people who are on one side of the alley who have to move it to the other side of the alley. And plus, they're putting it on the, in front of the neighbor's property, perhaps their, uh, their garage apron or whatever and you can have issues with that. We have not pursued that. Next slide. But with all the pluses and the minuses, we presented to the council and we said, okay, well, what would an extra refuse driver one cost us if we were to choose to stay semi-automated versus what, is the, what are the costs if we go with a fully automated truck and not have to hire that additional person? And it came down to a difference of $118,000 and 300, or $118,336, which paying an extra person every year, that cost is going there. Whereas with the truck, uh, you certainly don't expect to have to pay anywhere near that kind of money from year to year. So there's the benefit of having that fully automated truck. Next slide. So here's a picture. It's a typical front loading truck that's used in the commercial uh, application, typically picking up two yard, four yard, six yard containers. Those two arms come down on the front side, slide into pockets on either side of the container, pick it up and lift it straight over the top, and it dumps it into the hopper on the top. Next slide. In our case, we have mounted on those two forks uh, what is called the Corrado can. And you can see on the left hand side, you have that yellow a mechanical grabber claw arm. From tip to tip, it's 81 inches. From tip to tip, it's 81 inches. And the arm extends out a total of only five feet to grab the cart, pulls the cart back, dumps it into that front container, which is about a four and a half yard container, and then periodically the driver has to Dip, uh, dump the cart into the upper hopper, just as a commercial hauler does with the containers that they empty. Next slide. So I, I wanted to, someone um, had said something about how important communication is. I think that was uh, Mayor Pro Tem Linda Graham Murray expressed how important and how much desire there is that we need to educate the public about our programs to make it effective. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I thought, well, I'm going to look up something about communication. Here's my first quote that I took off the internet. Wise men speak because they have something to say. Fools because they have to say something. That was said by Plato, uh, Athenian philosopher. He was the student of Socrates and the teacher of Aristotle. Sometimes I think, uh, I'm sure, that I kind of go back and forth between those two classifications of people. And the thoughts of people listening to me probably have that same sense. Oh, that was pretty smart, but the rest of the time, eh, he's just talking. <laughs> but I do think that trash is a very, very important uh, subject and communication is key to providing a good service to our citizens. Next slide. So what are the efforts that we make as a solid waste department uh, about our solid waste programs? Well, community-wide, we use our annual newsletter, The Waste Paper, which gets mailed in June. I believe it's at, its, at the printer right now. Um, we provide extra copies to the water department where people go to have their water turned on for their new residence and their name uh, put into the billing cycle so they can get a copy even though they weren't here in June they could have a copy of that newsletter uh, we make them as available at City Hall as handouts at City Hall we make it available at the area recyclers I know we also provide them out to the landfill next slide <coughs> solid waste information line that's a tree communication tree on a landline baseline and uh, I'm sure uh, people don't like it, but it's got an awful lot of information if you're willing to take the time to search for it. We have the city website, and on the city website we have the Notify Me program, which is where someone can evidently sign up if they have an email, and they can receive automatic notifications that pertain to solid waste, if that's what they're interested in, solid waste. I think they can check things about parks, perhaps. Specifically, if they want parks, they can get police information, they can get fire information, they can get all different categories. I asked my uh, secretary, my office coordinator, how many people do we have signed up for solid waste information? She said, oh, maybe 30 at the most. Hmm. We have more customers than 30, but people say, well, how am I supposed to know when you've made a change or how am I supposed to know about the program? Well, we got the waste paper, we got the city's website, we got the information line, they could sign up for Notify Me as any interest of any other int uh, city departments. And then we use the social media and Facebook, that's also on the city website. The news media reporting on uh, city council meetings, you know, that's the newspaper and the radio stations. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do put out news releases, as many departments do, about special programs. I'm sure there was something in the paper about the uh, mayor's declaration of emergency to change this or to change that or stop this or provide this service temporarily. Next slide. And finally, uh, it's not unusual for us to put a little poster or bulletin type thing on doors of City Hall for people who happen to come to City Hall they'll see something about the LEAF program, or about the citywide cleanup program. I don't know if there was anything on the door regarding that extra bag of trash, but again, they'd have to come to City Hall to see it. Next slide. So those are our efforts to deal with the citywide type distribution of information. We also make efforts to communicate with citizens, specific, specific customers. Uh, those 91 letters that we sent to those customers changing the set-out location from alley to curbside, we sent a letter to each of those. And we also have wire tags like this that we attach to the trash cart when we think there's some information the customer needs to be aware of. Next slide. We have two tags. We have one that's what we would refer to as our violation information tag. It's the orange tag, this one here. And on it, it says, lid must be fully closed to be collected. Please consider going to a larger or extra city supplied car. Container must be a city supplied car. Extra must be in a 33 gallon trash bag. Each bag of material outside cart must have a trash tag limited to 40 pounds. Overweight, 35, 65, 95. 110 pounds, unable to roll a cart. 
the surfaces in our alleys where we do semi-auto mm -hmm. and even some conditions on our street. When you try to move a car that's got a couple hundred pounds of material in it and you got potholes or gravel or mud or uneven brick surfaces pulling on that car or pushing it to get it uphill sometimes to the truck is not an easy effort. Only small amount of demolition and construction material allowed at one time. That is common to virtually all the communities that I'm aware of. Next line. Continuation, all this information is on this orange tag. Placement, please ensure that there is a clear, direct access from the street and alley and that it's on the same level. Some people like to set it up on a, a wall because their yard is level with that wall and they don't want to go down the alley. So they set a wall and they want us to handle the cart off the wall. Or they have it inside of a, uh, a bin and they want us to handle that. They might have it behind their boat. Well, walk around the boat and drag it around. We also say, we also have item material present that requires special handling and fee. They have a computer monitor inside their cart. It fits, but we can't take that. It's that special handling. Grass and yard waste, garbage of, uh, of food origin to be in sealed bags. Now, when we started the program, most cities say everything is supposed to be in a bag before you put it in a cart. I thought I was being a nice guy by saying, well, you know, there's cardboard, that's not gonna be, that's not gonna break down, it's not gonna be an issue, why put it into a bag? But people are not putting garbage of food origin in sealed bags and the carts that are out there are horrendous. Prevent unsanitary conditions, causes of nuisances. Please wash out your cart with soapy water. The guys are telling me we'd have to tag 80% of the carts. Take the time, make tag out, put it on the cart. You know, do you refuse to, to empty it if it's a dirty cart? And then there's a place for them to mark other. Please correct the issue set out as uh, marked on this tag. Thank you for your cooperation. Next line, next slide. And then ultimately we have contact information. That's all on this little orange tag. Mm -hmm. Gets wired to the cart. Next slide. So here's a cart. I'd say that that lid's not fully closed. I'm not really sure when this picture was taken. That's it could Jim's have been. House. It could have been. It could have been during the free 33-gallon bag for that period of time. I don't know. I didn't ask questions about it. But there's an example of some of the issues that we run into with uh, non-compliance with the intent of the program. Next slide. We do have a second car, uh, tag that is being, was generated specifically for the fully automated truck with the mechanical arm and claw. Lid fully closed, arrows on the lid point out towards the alley or curb line. We don't require that for the semi-automated. In fact, a lot of people purposely position their carts with the handle towards the travel lane because then the collector, the crew, can just grab it and drag it out right away as opposed to having to walk around the other side or trying to turn it 180 degrees. Cart must be three feet from all objects. I mentioned we've, we've, this, we've uh, removed a couple of mailboxes from their post with that fully automated claw, it's trees, that the cart's up against a tree, you can't grab it, poles, parked vehicles, also from recycling and other carts. That's on our specific tag for the mechanical fully automated truck. Next slide. I'm sorry, place cart, but could you back up? Place cart at the end of the driveway or within one foot of the curb or alley. That's the ideal situation. Next slide. A parked car can interfere with clear access, and we'll see a slide about this later. Even if the trash cart is only within, it was one, within one foot behind the curb, and it says where cars are or may be parked, place trash cart in street. We really struggled with that, and we get calls. You want me to put my trash cart in the street, it's going to get hit by a car. If it gets damaged, I'm not paying for it. Where cars are or may be parked, place the trash cart in the street with the wheels near or against the curb. Minimum of three foot distance must still be maintained from fixed objects. 
because the arm, the claw, is 81 inches wide. And we want to have clearance in order to safely operate that claw to grab that stationary cart without hitting or grabbing something, certainly not wanting to hit a parked vehicle. The winter, that's going to be very interesting because we really didn't go through a big winter this past year with the CART program. Um, I think one, some councilman maybe even received an email here recently talking about um, winters and uh, if you visit websites of communities that have fully automated trucks, it's the customer's responsibility to dig out the windrows the curb line and create a space with three foot clearance on either side with their cart set back so that claw can grab it. Or you can put it out in the street, but then you have to contend with how do the plowmen handle that. Some communities have alternate street, alternate day parking on the street to try to avoid an issue that way. But this is uh, what's on the tag in the winter. Keep carts free of snow, unburied from snow banks, clear of ice and accessible to the collection truck. Never place carts on snow banks. Instead, shovel out a spot on the street so the cart can sit level. Next slide. On our website, in addition to the information that's on the tag that gets placed on a cart when we're having an issue, they say pictures are worth a thousand words. So we looked through a bunch of different websites for uh, ideas, and this was one of them. And this picture is going to be on our website when we finally update our website. And it shows the recycling cart is not next to the trash cart. It's at least three feet from a fixed object, such as the mailbox, and it's also three feet from a car. Next slide. And then we have a second picture. And you just notice that it says, if in front or behind a parked car, cart must be on, this, on the street, wheels against or near the curb. And again, we will see why that is the case. Three feet on either side of the cart. The cart itself is somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 18 inches wide. So the guy can close the claw a little bit, which I said was 81 inches from tip to tip, and then he can reach in and get it. But if he hits the wrong button or pushes the thing the wrong way, that arm can swing, that claw opens up, and you can catch vehicles that are too close to that cart. Next slide. So this would work for the semi-automated. I mean, there's prob that's probably one of the extra bags that was allowed for that period of time. And the recycling bin is leaning right there. Um, you could get that cart with a semi-auto. If you're using a fully auto, he's going to have to get out of the truck and go over there and move the stuff around and be able to use the arm. Next slide. Here's a, piece, here's a property, two properties side by side have been tagged numerous times. Please re have three foot distance between carts or any other fixed. Again, there's a, this is during your 33 because that cart that says Pawnee on it, that is not a standard issued cart. So that was the customer's cart. There's their recycling and there's the extra bag on the far side of the other 33 gallon cart. But they're all together. This truck, this, this house is on a fully automated route. Tags have been used, and yet that's what we have. Next slide. Now, this one, um, the biggest issue is it's so far back, away from the curb and everything. You could not reach it with a fully automated truck, and the guy, yes, he has to only walk another two or three steps to get that cart, but if every customer does that, you're adding a lot of time and effort. And that happens to be nice, smooth concrete. I don't know what it would be like in the winter if it was icy and having to go that much further to get that item and retrieve it. So I don't know if that got tagged, but that's really too far back. Next slide. This one's on the street like what we want, but look how close it is to the truck. 
Now, could an expert driver, that being very, very, very careful and moving very, very slowly, could he possibly pick that cart there without hitting that truck? Probably could. But eight times out of 10, he'd probably hit that truck. Okay, next slide. Now, that one is probably three feet in front of that vehicle, but it's back on the boulevard, what I call a boulevard. And the fully automated truck would have a very difficult time getting that cart. It could be done, but it would take a lot of effort, and we'll look at one like that in a few minutes. Next slide. Here's a trailer parked on the street. And that cart is right on the edge of the curb line. Can the fully automatic truck get it? Next slide. If he backs up and pulls forward and backs up and gets himself at an angle, he could get that cart in front of that trailer. In fact, I have a video of him doing it, but it's back and forward, back and forward. That's not very efficient use of his time. And to get that cart that's sitting up in the boulevard. Next slide. My gosh, how did this get into the picture in this groups? This will work for fully automated, although the man has to walk around the other side to get the handle. Mm -hmm. But for the, um, for the semi-automated, for the fully automated, that's perfect. There's at least three feet there between the recycling bin and the cart. It's right there. He can drive up, grab it, dump it, put it back down, and on his way. Next slide. Here's one that was just done today. There's a tag. You put the tag on the cart saying, I'm sure need to maintain three foot separation. In fact, you can see the tip of the arm there in the bottom right hand corner of the fully automated truck. So he's got the signpost in the way. Could he get it if he works very slowly and doesn't make any mistakes? He might be able to get it and not hit the signpost and probably reach over the top of a single layer recycling truck. Next slide. Here's carts on this street that have been tagged a number of times. There's cars, there's the cart up there on the boulevard. Uh, there's no way he's gonna get that with the fully automated truck. And yet it's on the fully automated truck's route. Next slide. Another example. In fact, it looks like there's a piece of cardboard or something like that laying there. Maybe that's recycling. No green bin to serve as a stop sign. Say, stop here, I got recyclables. The cart's overloaded, lid's full open. Uh, we've tagged the cart to educate the citizen, but the, nothing changes. Next slide. So I'm putting this back because, again, this is on our website. Talks about the distance. So let's, let's look to see if you follow the instructions that are on the tag in text or in the picture on the website. Let's go to the next one. And again, I wish I could show you a video, but we're not smart enough. And we've got a 2010 software, and we just weren't able to get it done. So we took a video, and we broke it down to a few snapshots. So there's a minivan. You can see it's parked maybe, I don't know, six inches off the curb. Uh, fully automatic trucks coming forward. Next slide. There's the cart sitting up in the boulevard. It's probably at least three feet from the car, but it's sitting up in the boulevard. Now he's going to extend his arms and close the claw to show what his reach is. Go ahead in the next slide. That's where he can't get it. The, ta the tag and the illustration indicates put your cart in the street with the wheels against the curb or a little bit more away from the curb. Next slide. Cart got moved back into the street, that close to the curb, reaches out, he's able to grab the cart, pulls it back to the hopper or to the container. Next slide. And he's able to dump it. But it requires the cart to be on the street surface in order to be working in amongst cars. Next slide. So another quote for communication. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. We use all these means to get the information out generally 
We use the trash tags on the carts themselves, thinking this should take care of it. I had a call from a citizen the other day. We've been tagging their cart for like four straight weeks, and the cart was still several feet away from the curb. We left. I told the driver, leave the cart. He did. The phone rang. Hey, they didn't empty my cart. Well, your cart wasn't where it needed to be. It's in the same place it's been for the last 15 years. How come it's not, what do you mean it's not in the right place? Do you have a, a tag wired to the lid of your cart? Well, yes. Have you read it? Why no? I just saw tags on the neighbor's carts and I just figured you just were putting out information <laughs> And I said, well, read the bullet, read it to me. So she started to read the cart or the tag to me. Oh, I see. I'm supposed to have it closer to the curb. Yes, that's correct. So will you send the driver back? We sent the driver back. Now, we haven't had a problem with that address since then. So George Bernard Shaw, Irish playwright, wrote... Uh, Pygmalion, Pygmalion, what is it, Pygmalion? Uh, My Fair Lady movie was made off of it. He's a critic and a polemicist. I believe I said that correctly. He likes to argue, kind of, so, and uh, someone like, um, uh, oh, who's the guy that wrote Common Sense? Thomas Paine, mm -hmm. back in the uh, Revolutionary War. He was considered the same type of guy. Next slide. So, attempting to communicate with a specific customer. We've got all the general information out there. We've been putting the tag out there on a regular basis. So now we're going to go beyond the wire tag in an effort to communicate with the citizen. Now, we, can, we haven't done this, but uh, we could ask the driver, send me a letter, or send me the ad, give me the address of that house, and I will send them a letter with all the details and take the time to do that. The alternative to that is to leave the trash cart or trash uncollected. It could be an extra trash bag that doesn't have, it's, the lid's full open like the one picture. They'll take the bag out, wire a tag to it, and set it on the ground and empty the cart, and they'll leave that extra bag or bags of garbage there with the trash tag on it. Or it may be a case where the trash cart is too far back or it's behind a boat or behind a car. <coughs> and so then they just drive right on past. They don't stop. They don't go out to wire another tag on. They've been wiring tags to it. It hasn't done any good. So they just drive by and they leave it person calls in and says, hey, my cart was missed. No, your cart wasn't missed. It wasn't out where it needed to be. And we've, we will say, the driver says, he's tagged your cart three and four times. No, I've never seen a tag in my, I've never seen a tag, never have. Okay, I'll send the driver back and he'll meet with you face to face and show you what you need to do to get your cart empty. But you need to take responsibility to put your cart where it needs to be in order for us to do that. And so we're at that point now where the men want to begin just leaving the carts uncollected. Now, what happens if they call us? Do we go back and get it? And if it happens again, do we not go back and get it? Or I believe that the city of Davenport has what they call an extra trash program where you, got, you pay $25 for a collection that is mid-schedule week. Yeah. Now, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm writing something to the people up there because I want to ask them a few questions about their program. <laughs> One of them is going to be, do you charge for missed trash? Or if you think about it, if we don't go back and empty their cart and their cart's full, let's say that they've got a 95-gallon cart mm -hmm. and they fill their cart weekly. 
So now they're going to have three bags probably between this week and next week at a $4 trash tag each. Now there, there's $12 right there. If we're going to go back, take the time to go back and get it, do we charge them three trash tags? Do we charge them four trash tags? Do we do something like that? But we are having, we have people who are just not seemingly getting the message. And as I said, we're at that point right now where we either start sending letters to that specific address or we're just going to leave the trash cart. The trash cart, leaving the trash cart or leaving the trash yes. seems to get their attention like that. Now, are they going to call us? Are they going to call the city manager? Or are they going to call you? But I want you to understand sure. we are doing all that we can short of and we have we've gone up and knocked on the doors and people will not answer the door and they can hear them inside the house now maybe they're maybe <coughs> they're uh, disabled or maybe they're sick in bed i don't know but we are trying to communicate with our people well, our customers I, I think you you know the 27 tons a week during the free trash bag period which so that they when they want to hear it, they're hearing the message, right? So I, I have, if you've, if you've tagged them and tagged them again, I don't have a problem with you driving by until, until you get their attention. That's just me. I'll be the first to admit that in my younger days, I've maybe ignored a tag or two. Uh, but once the, my trash didn't get picked up, I paid attention real quick. So I, I agree. I, and to be honest, I thought we were already doing that. Which is why I was trying to question. I was beginning to question why are we having so many trouble, so much trouble? Because I would assume we would have already addressed most of the issues over the last eighteen but, months. But when that happens, we, we can't. We that. can't wash out. No. So, right. Hey, Don. Yes. Have you ever thought about having a sticker or spray paint or something, and actually leaving an X for the customer? This is where it needs to go. Well, if you're talking about ca parked cars, parked cars aren't always in the same spot. I mean, yeah. I had a customer say, well, come out and put a piece of uh, tape mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. street, and that's where I'm going to put my cart. And I'm thinking, well, okay, what happens if a car is pulled up parts. on that or partway on it? What are they going to do? And, and, and I believe they would say, hey, I can't do it because, you know, the tape mark was covered up. People have to take responsibility and they have to be able to make some judgment on, well, in order for my cart to be picked up, I'm going to have to do this. Now, again, the efficiency, number one, we tell everybody, everybody take their carts out to the curb. Well, I don't really like, like that idea because, number one, it would be very, very inconvenient for a lot of people in the city. But it would be consistent, everybody being treated the same. But there are streets where there's a lot of cars. There's gonna, I'm, I'm expecting there's going to be some issues, you know, mm -hmm. with cars. Yeah, because you never know where your neighbors and kids so you have you have car. the customer does what they you ask them to do, and then the neighbor pulls their car up and parks their bumper two feet away from the car. Mm -hmm. So you got to have for the fully automated program to work well, you have to have the customer, you have to have the neighbors understand. And you have to have, of course, the driver that's careful with the thing. And there are going to be some circumstances, I think, where it's going to be difficult. We've talked internally about whether we should just bypass this block or this section and turn it back over to, uh, you know, to the semi-automated. You know? So then we start hopping here and hopping there trying to uh, provide. Now, the one thing that we've done, and I think the city manager suggested, and I honestly thought in the beginning, to reorganize all our routes. Um, the core of the city is the hardest part with the alleys mm -hmm. and the hills. The outer reaches are easier to do, for the most part. Mm -hmm. We could go and change all our routes and try to educate the the citizen, your route's been changed. The drivers would re have to re redo their routes. The recycling crews would probably, I assume they would want to continue following the trash routes as we do, and they'd have to change. We've, got, we've gotten by with what we've done thus far with 91 customers having their set out location changed. 
We could increase our efficiency if we do something with the alleys and we say everybody on one side, which some communities have gone through the heartache of making their citizens do that. One thing I haven't thought about is saying, well, take one side of the alley and tell them to go out to the curb and leave this one in the alley. So you drive through the alley once and get one side, and you swing around and you pick up the street from on the other side. But we have a lot of terrace properties. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult in many cases to find all the houses are on level ground. And so, I don't know, it's, uh, it's been a challenge, to say the least. To, to Linda's credit, um, uh, at AFL Centro, which is the base where I was stationed at, that's how they did it. They had a marked portion on the curb, and you weren't, weren't it was against uh, the rules to park in front of that. Um, so people would put, have to put their trash against this marked space. And the problem is we didn't have any snow out there. So what happens in the middle of January when there's eight inches of snow on the ground, you can't see it. So. <laughs> Well, then you're supposed to go around and uh, shovel the snow Heck, off yeah. of the excess. <laughs> so that's really all I have to say. I wanted to bring it to your attention. Um, the three what? different size carts, I'm sure the customers love it. It's a lot of work, extra work. I would guess if we only had one size cart instead of 16 to 20 hours a week, we'd be spending two or three hours a week at most. We wouldn't be bringing carts back to wash them out because it's the wrong size cart because they've already got the size cart that they want. What, what size are we typically using in the, in the whole the middle size or the large? I think about 56% of the carts that are out there are 65s. 66. And about 25, 26% are 35s. And the other 15, 16% is the 95. And we definitely, I mean, we have 200, and I think it was said 24 or something like that, 35s that have been returned to us, which we are not going to have a use for. I mean, we obviously there may be a few houses that say, gee, I'd like a 35, but the lion's share of those carts are going to sit there. Ten years use. down the line, you're going to be using those. That's oh, my prediction. Okay. Yeah, because everything, um, they're really going to cut back on packaging so way back. So are you looking for a direction from us as far as this drive-by drive program or just want an understanding from us? I want an understanding that we're going to have to start doing that. If we're going to get uh, any near efficiency, uh, whether it be fully automated or semi-automated. I mean, if people are leaving their carts behind cars, even for the semi-automated, that takes time. You got to drag that across and get it around and get it out the street. And then they complain if the cart's not put back where they left it to begin with. And, you know, we just need to start getting cooperation. And the best way to do that is, I believe, to leave the trash uncollected. Okay. Next slide. I would say, it, with respect to that, though, if they call you and you go and address it, it would be appropriate to collect it. If they do it again, then you would leave it and not that, collect it. That is, I believe, part of uh, trying to eliminate the illusion of communication and say, well, we met face to face. Yep. We talked about it. I don't have an illusion anymore. You said you understood it. That's where it's supposed to right. be. The next time, there's no excuse. What they will say is, well, I, I didn't take it out. My, my boy took it out. <laughs> My dog took it out. Or my daughter, or my, my, you know, somebody else took it out. Well, you have to take responsibility mm -hmm. to communicate with your own family or whatever. Next slide. And we come to the end. What? I have the garbage. Where's that one? Yeah, that's Where's twice that? now. That's, that's twice now. That's oh. twice. I believe Thanks, I'll have I, the garbage. I worry about copyright laws. I'm not <laughs> sure. If, I, I'm not really sure if that's copyright free, so. But I did like that slide. That's one it's for favorites. educational purposes. I think you're okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for the answer. Right. I'm sir. sorry for the length of time. No, you're fine. Be. You're good. All right. Is then, uh, to, uh, let's go around the horn here. Eric, do you got anything else? <coughs> Chief? Nick? Dang it. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> we may have an addition to the agenda. Um, I should know by the end of the week for a set date just a set date for the flood wall plan spec so okay. I'll know later this week all right major no sir uh, Jessica okay. no Stephanie Don anything else uh, only I was expecting the question can we go to fully automated citywide 
Um, I, I would think that would be very difficult. Yep. You probably have to go off curbside and uh, line up Mike. Yeah, probably better. Probably better. I was ex I was expecting the question: Can we go fully automated? Yeah, I just don't see. I think we kind um, of all know the answer to that, don't we? I think I think that would be very difficult. Although I do believe there are communities who have terraced properties and hills as bad as Burlington, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just just mm -hmm. like yeah, that. I know what you're saying. That they say we're all going we're going to curbside. That's just the way it's going to be. Yeah. And then they deal with it somehow. Yeah. And um, like I said, you can improve your efficiency, but the effect on the customers to save maybe 50 cents a month or something like that, or one person falling and breaking something, they're going to wish they were paying that extra money for that alley service. Yep. Service. So. Um, I, I think that uh, what we have will work uh, over time. Um, I don't know if we'll get the efficiency of numbers of that many more houses. We are doing the routes that typically are two men on with one man. Um, when he's not there, there's got to be another driver that can operate that truck. Um, but I think that uh, to go fully automated for another truck or the major portion of the city, uh, he's picking up probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 23 to 25 percent of our customers. But, and I would hope that it would uh, stay that much, if not a little bit more, as we improve our cooperation sure. by our citizenry. But I cannot see, in all good conscience, going to fully automated for citywide. Okay. Jim? Radio. Yes, I was going to bring it up. Who can do radio to this week? I can do it. Matt? Robert? Okay, Matt and Robert. It's 9 o'clock, Wednesday. All right, we're looking to open City Hall up to the public beginning next Monday. Uh, we still will be encouraging folks to do as much business online as they can, uh, call in, uh, do things by phone as, as much as possible. Uh, it just most things that you need to pay can be done over the, through, the, through our website, so we, anything that we can get done that way, please do. Uh, but uh, we, we will be able to, we will open the doors and, and start having uh, business in City Hall. Okay. Um, council meetings will still be online uh, and not open. And in, the main reason is, is, I mean, even what we had today, we had three people who participated outside of staff and uh, we almost maxed out our ability to social distance in here uh, with that. So we're, it, while we're in this world of trying to do social distancing, uh, the only way we can allow complete uh, access for, for people who want to be a part of it is to participate online. Uh, I, don't, I just don't know how to na navigate it otherwise yeah. yet. Is there any way we could try and get the uh, discussion items that have been on the future discussion items? We're going to start off one at a time. Yep, we're going to start. We don't have them all here at the same night because of that reason, but I mean, uh, Friends of Cascade Bridge, Impact 7G. I mean, I would imagine we could yep. probably do those and meet those guidelines. Uh, no, yeah, we're we're gonna. They'll be at, both be it would would be at work sessions. Yeah. So those will be ones that uh, we had a discussion in our last department head meeting that we need to get those moving and, and find places where they can come in and uh, at, at one of the upcoming ones. And as we worked with them, uh, those two in particular you mentioned, uh, the Friends of Cascade Bridge had really seemed to want to be after uh, Impact 7G. So we're probably going to get try to get Impact 7G here first uh, when, when it works with their schedule. and. Given the dynamics of the uh, people still aren't traveling the same same way that they were in the past, so those are groups that we'll have to see where the, where it does fit in. Uh, but we do want to start having that stuff happen and getting that ticked off of our yeah, uh, been future, on the future meetings. Session for months. Uh, legislative session began last week. Uh, their goal is to be done by the end of this week. Uh, if you had seen. Um, I mean, the, the main thing that they have left to do is to set a budget. Uh, the revenue estimating, whatever it is, I want to say committee, it's not committee. Um, council, it might be it, uh, came up with their estimate of 
a shortfall. Uh, the number was 65 million less next year than what the current year's number was, uh, and that also is 350 million less than what they had originally anticipated uh, for next year's budget. So they're having to make some cuts. Uh, the biggest concern that we would have from an operational standpoint would be as if backfill was hit. Everything that I have heard is their goal is not to touch backfill. They don't want to cause additional damage to cities at this point. But they still have to figure out where they can hit a compromise. So that's probably the biggest issue. And you know, if you have any communications with uh, our legislators, um, you know, we, we mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, or near the beginning of the meeting, that uh, you know, on a 20 plus million dollar general fund budget, we came into the year with, uh, I mean, my, my, my spreadsheet says $7,000 positive balance. I think our, what we had in the budget book is actually a deficit of 10 to 20,000. Um, right now, if I look at the numbers that we have to take into account, it's more like a $500,000 deficit. Uh, backfill accounts for f over 400,000 of our general fund. So we already have a big hole that we have to try to figure out how to work through uh, during this upcoming year, and we can't, it's, I don't know how to handle that other, that additional. So just make sure you communicate that. And correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I read the, the thing that you sent us this week, uh, the state is gonna honor their loss commitments through the end of the year? Through the end of this year, correct. And then to give us an opportunity to try and plan? So they'll, and then they'll give us our estimates for next year in about, mid-August is what they're anticipating. Okay. If I, I mean, that's essentially what their announcement had. We usually get those numbers, I think, in June. So this is a little, I don't know when we'll get that, when we'll actually get it, if it'll be that late, but okay. yeah. And that's, and that's part of the nature of not being able to tell, I mean, just making a lot of guesses as to mm -hmm. what next year mm -hmm. is. So that's all I had. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Bill? Robert? Uh, Thursday night at the Burlington Bees are going to do their food night again. Uh, actually, they're doing it during the afternoon as well. So from 11.30 to 1, you can do lunch. Uh, from 4 to 7, you can do dinner. And they got tenderloins and all the other food they normally have. And then this time, they're having a, like a $10 add-on option where you can get a beach towel and a baseball and a, and a koozie just to get some Bees merchandise, too. So uh, I went to... Um, one night and ordered some food and it was, it was kind of cool and we just hung out in the, in the grass and ate and uh, kind of soaked it in a little bit so Thursday night. Okay, uh, Matt? No. Linda? This is a new program that the mayor wanted me to share with you. It comes from the Secretary of State. It's a program called Safe at Home and you ask what is Safe at Home? It's a new program that uh, if you are a survivor of domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, stalking, or other violent crimes, you wanna get your pin out, because I'm gonna give you a number. So Save at Home will provide you with an address. It's an address confidentiality program is what it is. So if you want more information, go to their webpage, which is safe at home at iowa.gov. I'm going to repeat that again. Safe at home at iowa.gov and the phone number is 515-725-SAFE. 515-725-SAFE. So again, new program by the Secretary of State. Safe at home. Okay. Anything else? All right. I think that's about it for the day. Um, you know, I just want to take a second um, to see what's going on in our nation. Uh, on a daily basis on the TV. Uh, I'm really proud of the staff here at, Burl in, at Burlington. I'm proud of our police department and uh, proud of our citizens and the way we've demonstrated that we can communicate and keep communicating and working forward to uh, a nice, peaceful community. So uh, you got your mayor's thanks and you got your city council's thanks. I'll speak for them. And, and uh, uh, there were some hard things talked about and discussed but that's how we get better so thank you for that